If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Hey, how many people are waiting for this interview? Dude, <gasps> this, <gasps> this was a very deep episode. I mean, we got to interview Lane Norton again. We had a great time with him the first time. Was it a year ago or so, two years ago? Yeah, last time we got to drink. This yeah. time- No, we went deep, dude. No. We He talked about like- his oh, yeah. divorce, yeah, cheating. What caused the divorce? Right. He talked about you know his uh, what was it uh, Avatar Nutrition a little bit. Yeah, mm. he talked about what he's doing now, like the difficulties Lots of chaos. Like Lane got uh, very vulnerable, and I will commend him for his honesty. Like he was, we yeah. asked him questions that were t- tough to answer, mm-hmm. and he was very honest with his answers. I mean, he was he was open. There was nothing that was off the table. You're gonna hear a side of Lane. On this episode, that I don't think you've heard anywhere else. I don't think you've heard anywhere else. Yep, I'm not gonna, at all. I'll make that claim. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've listened to a lot of Lane for sure. So I, I thought he did really well with the questions that you get. You know, we're all yeah. Well, uh, I think the first time, Adam, the first time we had to get it out with the whole getting drunk and hanging out because there was this little. We had to break the ice a little bit, yeah. right? Because yeah. everyone thought the IFOIM, the anti IFOIM guys, and the IFOIM guy were going to go head to head on some right. shit. And it's just like no, World was, War Three, right? So yeah, I think that was. Happen. There was a little, there was a little more nerves in the room on that that meeting versus this one where we kind of all knew each other. And I think you can tell in the interview. I think we're definitely, they're definitely called any bullshit that anyone felt while they were talking. And dude, I this think, is fire. Yeah, it's yeah. a fire. It's a fire interview. It was epic. It was a good. It was very, very good. Good, good job on Lane. Uh, so uh, here's some of the places you can check him out. And of course, it's Lane Norton. You can go to Bio Lane. That's B I O L A Y N E dot com. He's also released a book called The Complete Contest Prep Guide. Now, we've had a chance to kind of thumb through it, but we've seen lots of people's reactions to it, people who've already read it, and apparently it's badass. People are saying it's really good. Now, knowing Lane as well as we do and all the stuff he's put produced in the past, I can tell you this. I know Lane has done a, a very good job of making this as good as he possibly oh, can. There's lots of heavy content in there. Good content, and the guy's got integrity. That's one thing... Uh, that we respect with him uh, the most. So you can get his book at biolanestore.com. We also did an IIFOM video with him on our YouTube channel, which you'll find on Mind Pump TV, and it should be up there coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. But, I mean, is there anything else to say? Yeah, you can also find him on his Physique Science Radio, too. So he has a podcast. I know he's not as consistent as we are on there, but he still gets some pretty – High profile uh, guests on there, a lot mm-hmm. of doctors, a lot of scientists that come on there and they talk about some great topics. So you can find his uh, physique science radio on uh, iTunes. That's also. right. And then before we get to the interview, uh, I do want to remind those of you listeners this month you can get free access to our private forum for enrolling in any of our MAPS bundles. Of course, our most popular bundle is the Super Bundle, which includes uh, a year of exercise programming, several MAPS programs you follow in succession for an entire year, uh, mindpumpmedia.com. And without any further ado, here we are interviewing Lane Norton. You're uh, you're training for a competition right now too, yeah? Well, I actually dropped out of the Arnold. Oh, you Uh, did? Why would I? Well, because I aggravated my back in um, uh, December. Dude, what's so. happening? You keep you keep getting hurt. And you're, do you, do you think yeah, there's man. mobility? Maybe some mobility shit going on. Uh, well, you know, part of it is just when you lift heavy weights long enough, shit happens. But I actually went and saw. Um, it's a disc bulge that keeps getting ag- aggravated, and it's actually not even that bad of a bulge. It's just when it gets flared up and it hits that nerve, it just locks you up. Um, so I actually went and saw Stu McGill. Okay. You know him, like, mm-hmm. the, oh, the wait, that's McGill. Uh, he back does the mechanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's the back mechanic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the back. Yeah. The so, dude, yeah. what, what did he see? What did he see in you? What was the What was the deal? And it was really cool. It was me, him, and Brian Carroll. I don't know if you guys know Brian Carroll, mm-hmm. but uh, they just wrote a book together called um, "The Gift of Injury." So, Brian, just to give you some background. Brian has squatted over a thousand pounds. I think he was the first guy at two forty two to squat a thousand. Um, Holy shit! And then. Uh, equipped and then he uh went to 275 i think he squatted over a thousand pounds of competition like 50 plus times i think he's the guy who's done it the most um he so he got so bad that when he went he tried all kinds of stuff he and finally Stu was like his last hope and he went to him and uh it's actually a funny story because everybody on his mri's missed this Stu pulls up his mri and says do you see anything 
weird here. His sacrum was broken. Oh shit! Like he had actually and nobody else picked this up. No, <laughs> he had in plate fractures and all of his vertebrae. I didn't and use that. like, um, it, well, because keep in mind when they're looking at MRI, they don't know what to, they don't even think about what to look for because they don't have context, right? He could be a ninety year old man for all they know, right? So he had like crushed a disc, split his sacrum, uh, herniated another disc, and then had in plate fractures all over the place, right? And he's like, "Yeah, I want to compete again." And Stu's like. <laughs> he's like why don't we just try to get you pain free first and then let's cross that bridge and we get there and less than a year later he squatted a thousand pounds again wow and he, actually what's crazy is in the book they show his MRI like a couple years later and it looks normal people don't realize this they get like herniated discs and think it's like a death sentence that's right there's like spontaneous disc resorption it happens you know well they call so, it spontaneous because they don't know they, they don't know why they, they think cause, they don't yeah. know why but I, I think when you change um, recruitment Stop. patterns when you when you you're, oh that's look at set, listen to the sound, sound of that. sound of cancer listen to the sound of that cancer <laughs> yeah sound of smoke, a slow death smoke, yeah. smoke that drink yeah. down <laughs> so it, uh, uh, that when you work on mobility and stuff you start to see people heal in pretty amazing ways what what kind of things was was McGill doing with them so actually one of the things that McGill said is is mobility like spine mobility is not what you want to do if you're a power lifter if you're a power lifter he said spines do they can do mobility well and they can do stiff and rigid well. They don't do both together well, right? So if you're a gymnast or somebody or, or some kind of athlete where spine mobility is really important, then yes, you want a mobile spine. He said for a powerlifter, you want to be stiff, rigid. He said uh, looseness is the enemy of power. Sure. So what he did with Brian was basically like never bend your spine what? ever. Yeah. So, like, just basically get yourself used to being in a rigid position. I mean, even down to the point where, like, when I got there, somebody uh, spilled something on the floor. When Brian went down to clean it, I mean, he went like this. I'm dropping to one knee. Oh, wow. And then he kind of like this, right? And he made sure he, like, he was braced, cleaning it up, like, very, very diligent. But wow. Stu said, you know. Well, you're talking about extreme athletes. Somebody who's right. going to squat 1,000 yeah. pounds. This right. Isn't, this isn't how you would treat the average but, person, obviously. Right. But Stu said, you know, one of the things you got to realize is that, <clears throat> those discs sit inside a collagen matrix. And when a bulge happened, it's because that matrix kind of um, starts to break down a little bit and that disc pokes through, okay? He said, like, think about an orange. If you wanted to squeeze a, a, a seed out of a, or, or, or a lemon, if you wanted to squeeze a seed out of a lemon, you're going to push on the opposite side, right? So for power lifters, they always get a disc bulge going this way, mm -hmm. right? So you want to prevent that spine bending because every time you bend that spine Push you're wearing back. you're wearing on that right. collagen matrix right you're squeezing on the other end right so uh you know he has three exercises that he's very big on for power bird dogs mm -hmm. um done properly and he showed me how to do them properly because i was doing them wrong everybody <laughs> almost does <laughs> yeah he said you know if you're doing a bird dog right you should be breaking a sweat within a you know a couple reps bird dogs uh, he calls what he calls the mcgill curl up mm -hmm. which is basically like not a sit up and not a crunch. No, it's a very slow each right. vertebrae. Yeah, right? so you, you're you're putting your hands under your back, you're putting one leg out, and you're just kind of bracing your core, thinking about pushing here. And um, I'm pointing at my obliques, by the way. <laughs> and um, and then just getting tight here and barely just bringing your head up off the ground. And then um, uh, side planks is what he has people do a lot of. But there are some other ones as well. So I went there. He looked over. Well. First off, he did an assessment on me. And by this time, I was mostly pain-free. Like, I could aggravate it here and there, but I was pain-free when I saw him. And I told him that. He said, don't worry, I'll find it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he put me through like about an hour of an assessment and he found it. He's like... What did he do that made it hurt? Um, Man, I, it's hard for me to even really? remember because okay. he put me through so many things. But like, but he had me sit up, stand down, pull on a chair. He put me in a hyperextension, flexion. Mm -hmm. All different kinds of things. And finally, like, after kicking my legs one or two times, I had a little twinge. And he's like, yep, you got nerve drag. He's like, the first time I, he's like, it's that first time that, that nerve goes to that, that, uh, the, the canal. Mm -hmm. I could be saying this wrong. It dragged. He's like, but then, so then he did it again and I didn't feel anything. He's like, yeah, once it goes through that one time, it's fine. But yeah, he, he's like, you got nerve drag, son. And um, he's like, we're going to see this, 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 and this on the MRI. And he was dead on. 
Yeah. Uh, he hadn't even seen it yet, and he was dead on. So so now you've been working with him? Yeah. So he actually, um, he said overall I had a really great spine. He's like, you know, you don't have any scoliosis. You don't have any weird stuff going on. You know, he's like, oh, overall, your spine is really great. And he said, I've never seen anybody in your position if they did everything I asked them to do who did not get back to full strength. Mm. So the other nice thing he said, too, is because, you know, I get all kinds of shit on the Internet for the way I squat. He said, um, he's like, nah. He's like, you got as you've gotten absolutely as much out of your frame as you can. The the way you squat is exactly how you should squat. Now he, one of the things I've had problems with when I get fatigued is I tend to go into a little bit of flexion, mm -hmm. and that's what's caused my problems. He said, but in terms of your forward lean and all that kind of stuff, he said you have long legs. If you want to get to parallel, that's how you have to get to parallel. And he's like, you would not do based on the way your legs sit in your acetabulum you would not do better going wider. You would lose power. Yeah. So he's like, you've done, uh, basically, you know, you've managed to get out of it he, what you he's can. He's obviously speaking to you like a, a, a pro athlete. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you're somebody yeah. who cares about power. Like totally yeah. different than the way he probably would communicate with the average Jane or Joe. Yeah. Yeah, like if you went to him and you're like, listen, I'm done competing, but I want to be pain-free. I want to be, you know, just be able to play with my kids or whatever. It'd be a different, it'd be a different little bit story. different. Yeah. yeah, different story. I mean, you know, you can never tell somebody, hey, you're not going to injure yourself again because that's just not a reasonable thing to tell somebody. Shit happens. But, um, yeah, I've been doing the stuff he's asked me to do every day. Short walks, three 10-minute walks a day, doing bird dogs and McGill curl up mm -hmm. and side planks afterwards. And um, I've been pain-free, like completely pain-free for almost two months. How many How many times now have you had uh, an injury like this stop you from being able to compete? Is this the third or fourth time? Third time. This is the third time? Yeah, very frustrating. Now, I know you've been asked this question, and I see this a lot on your Instagram, which, by the way, man, uh, people either seem to love you or can't stand you. You're, you're, <laughs> it's the best way to be, right? Extremely yeah. polarized. Maybe. True. Maybe it is. But, who, but, but, uh, I'll just tell you how I think. But yeah, true. Why do, uh, at what point do you think you'll be like, okay, I need to like stop. I need to stop doing this. Or is it because people tell you to stop that you're like, fuck you, I'm going to keep <laughs> yeah. going? Yeah. Uh, definitely the latter. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. That's good you know that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm going to sit here and lie and say if I, I mean, people who say, oh, I don't care about what anybody else says. Uh, I kind of think people who say that are full of shit, to be honest with you. Everybody cares about what somebody else says to a certain extent. Sure. Um, I don't care enough to let it affect me so much that I change the whole way I live my life. But yeah, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say I don't look, you know, maybe if so, everybody just said, hey, great career, man. You're awesome. Great job. You did as much as you could. Probably wouldn't have that same fire to go back and prove people wrong. Yeah. Like that, that, you know, I, I live for a comeback. That's, <laughs> I love that, you know, so. Um, I know last time we, we met with you, we talked, uh, we had a long interview and you talked a lot about, uh, that long. yeah, it was about four hours. <laughs> Our longest. It was four hours. Yeah. That's, a, that's um, still to date the marathon. marathon dude, it was. Uh, and we talked about how I could have gone longer. Yeah, yeah, oh, <laughs> that's what she, I see. Uh, <laughs> exactly. But I, you know, you, you talked about how growing up you went through all yeah, this, satisfying. this times of bullying where you were yeah. dealing with these people who were just fucking fucking with you the whole time yeah do you think that's why maybe somebody says don't do something now and you're like i'm gonna do it now just because you said 100 percent. yeah yeah, yeah. You, could that be a if you if you don't want me to do something just tell me i did a good job mm. <laughs> <laughs> otherwise i'm gonna fucking do it and, and tell you i did it and remind you when you told me i could do it yeah. you know like that's that's one of the best things in life for me yeah. like mm. you know people could say oh well that's you got somebody psychoanalyze me and say, well, that's not healthy or this and that. The way I look at it is where, wherever you get drive from is a good thing, yeah. you know? So I could let that. They might disagree just because you've been hurt so many times. That's yeah. Well, <laughs> say, yeah. And listen, if well, I, I don't know, man. It's not working out that well. well right? And that's why I was glad I went to Stu because, you know, if yeah. he'd said to me, hey, listen, you're, you're really teetering on the edge of no return in terms of not being able to live a pain-free lifestyle. You really need to. Yeah, you probably reevaluate then, then, that. Then, then we're going to have a different conversation. Right, right, I mean, right, maybe, right. maybe okay, maybe it's time to go back to bodybuilding or maybe do something else, right? But he said, there's no reason you can't get back on the platform and, and mm -hmm. compete at a high level. So if somebody tells me that, if they just tell me all it takes is time, I'm a very diligent, focused, patient person. I mean, I've done a comeback before, I can do it again. And uh, yeah, I love proving people wrong. Mm -hmm. That's That's the most favorite thing in the world for me <laughs> where where are you where are you at right now in the uh, the recovery stage right now so are you how much longer of that and then when will you start yeah we'll probably start uh spine loading again in a few weeks okay. is my guess uh, uh brian is handling most of my recovery and um uh, but he communicates with Stu. and uh yeah i mean i uh 
I, I talked to him about possibly Raw Nationals in October, and he said he thought that that was a good a good goal. So, I mean, I did Raw Nationals this past year. I got seventh in my class, but that was the the entire month before that was just a wash of training. It was garbage. Like that was when I had some uh, business things going on that were very stressful, personal things that were very stressful. And I did not have one productive training uh, session the month before Raw Nationals and was dealing with multiple injuries. Um, You've had a like a like an avalanche of shit. Yeah, it was yeah. all came to, like crazy, you know what? like like oh, hold on like like I mean we don't want to gloss over this because any one of those things was break, stressful break or, somebody else. Uh, well, well, it's just those are all like if you list like the top five most stressful things you can go through in your, in, yeah. in your life. I had three of them at once. Literally, <laughs> you had three at the same time, and and uh, and all of them challenging your livelihood. In, in, in you know, in fact, yeah. I, I know that, I know you're not. We talked off air, and I know there's. You know, certain you can talk about certain things and you can't talk about other things, but you're not uh, with Avatar anymore. Uh, no, we have parted ways. You have parted so, ways, parted and that ways. was a company you started, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I was a co-founder in it. Yes, co-founder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it? So that's it. No more. You're doing that's it. Some other shit. That's you guys it. all friends? You cool? Um, <laughs> I wish them best of luck. Okay. okay. So <laughs> that's a nice way um, to say that. That's I like good. that. I like yeah. that answer. So. Yeah, but you know what? Now it's a, it's a blessing in disguise because now I get to focus on my own stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one of the big major mistakes I made in my life was I started investing too much in other people and I forgot about what I got into this industry for yeah. and like what my purpose was. And my purpose was I wanted to help people, I wanted to put out really good content, you know, yeah. and I wanted to make a difference. And so you know, do you feel like you can do that more now than before, or do you think that you weren't you weren't able to do it before with the same kind of freedom that you can now? I think that I can do it my way mm. and I can, uh, you know, cause I was very like, cause now it's when, just you. Now, now it's just me. It. Like I kind of looked at it like, man, I, like it was really upsetting. Cause I had this, I felt like I had this great thing that I was part of this great thing that could really help a lot of people. And then I realized I don't have to have that. Like I don't need permission to put out good content. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like I can still do that. And so I got back to it. And some of the, be the best compliments I've been getting lately is people saying, like I get complete strangers messaging me say, you seem like the lane from five years ago. Like you seem like you're back. You seem like you're mm -hmm. back to the guy that you were, you know? But the thing is like when you're going through personal shit or business shit or whatever, like it affects all your life. Like it's hard to separate. And especially me, I'm a kind of person, I wear my heart on my sleeve. You guys probably know this. Mm -hmm. I'm a very open person. And uh, so. Oh, like, I, I, was, mean, I, I mean, I uh, mean, shockingly so. I mean, it's refreshing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you did a, 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 I think it was on your YouTube channel where you talked about yeah, your, I, some of your personal issues with your, yeah. with your divorce and what happened yeah. with that. I had an affair. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you put it on, you put it on, on, on your, your page and yeah, tell me what, what your thought the, process yeah, was and when you did. Um, so I was really conflicted about that. Mm. Uh, not because I didn't want to be honest about what happened. Um, more so because I know my kids will see that one day, mm. you know, and I worry about kids in their classes, like if, you know, dad is more well known that other kids may use that to hurt them. Because I remember what kids would use to hurt me when I was young. But, um, you know, my, my ex had actually already put it out there. And, you know, that's, she has a right to do that. Like, so she, she went first? Yeah, she, she put it out there. Um, and she said affair. He had an affair. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, okay. um I didn't see you know, that. There was a yeah. video. When yeah. when did when did that? Ha so how long were you married? Uh, up until you got divorced, obviously. What was uh, like eight and a half years. When did that? When did the affair happen into that marriage? Uh, more recent. More recent. Yeah. So, so it was towards so the end of it. It was yes. It was definitely towards the end. Towards of the end of it. And so did you get? Did you? Did she catch you, or did you tell her what happened? Uh, when it happened, the next week I asked for a divorce. Because I, I'm, I'm not trying to act like obviously, it was, like, it was I'm, eating you I'm, up. I'm definitely not an ethical warrior, you know. Yeah. Like I've made, I made a mistake. Like no matter how unhappy you are, there's not an excuse to do that, you know. But sometimes it's not so black, you know. I five years ago, it's funny. I was a much more judgmental person because I'd look, I would look at exactly that and say, "You scumbag, you know. Why didn't you? If you were that unhappy, why don't you just break up?" Yeah. And then you get into it and you got kids and you've got businesses and you own a house together and all that kind of stuff. And it's just, sometimes you feel trapped, you know? And, um, but there's no, there's no excuse. Like I should, I should have been a stronger person, you know? But after it happened and I realized I didn't want to be married anymore, I, I, I asked for a divorce, you know? So, it, so you, you're the one that told her this is what happened. I didn't tell her that it happened mm. because, um, you know, I, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't have. 
but I was afraid that she would become very combative if I did that. And, you know, I, of course. And also, like, of course, it was a selfish thing. Like, nobody wants to admit that they screwed That's up. That's just the single know. act. When you really unpack it, there was probably much more going on for a lot longer with both of you. Uh, if you were unhappy, I'm sure there the... Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go into the personal stuff because, you know, like, a, a lot of it was me, too. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't handle shit well. Yeah. So, um, I don't want to put it all on her or make course. it seem like she's bad. I, She's not a bad. I'd rather talk. I'd actually rather um, talk about you and what what you've learned about yourself through that process. So, so two things. So, first off, like, um, so she once I asked for a divorce, she then went back and and she she then discovered why. Mm. Um, so and yeah, that was very difficult. <laughs> um. But what have I learned? So I've learned this. I want to. You guys only have my word for it, but I always did the right thing in my life. Like right down to like, I wouldn't even fucking litter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And this was the, this was a really important thing. and I fucked it up. You know what I mean? Like I didn't handle it the right way. And I have to explain it to my kids one day. You know what I mean? And that's going to be a hard conversation. I know that. Um, but I've learned, I've learned this. One, I'm really motivated to live the best life I can and treat people the right way because I screwed this up. And because integrity was so important for me and still is so important for me, even though I screwed this up. And the second thing is shit compounds. Every time I've ever lied in my life or done something wrong, it has come back and bit me in the ass without fail, 100%. I believe in karma, not from a spiritual standpoint, but just from a practical standpoint. Because here's the way it works. If you tell one lie, then you got to tell two more to cover that one up. And then you got to tell four more to cover those two up. And then you got to tell eight more. And it just it just eventually is an avalanche. That's right? incredibly, that's what they call moral truth. You have objective truth, which comes from you know science and the, and the scientific theory and testing hypothesis and the, whatever. And then there's moral truth, which has been with humans for thousands of years and is present in every culture and every major religion. And that is a fundamental rule that you see in all those things. And it's what separates you know, us. It's what separates us. And, and talking about, look, I went through a divorce also. I was married for 15 years. And I know just how, especially with kids, how challenging it could be. It'll break. One well, of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. It'll, it'll probably the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. It's, it is extremely difficult uh, to go through. And, um, you know, it's funny. I was reading this book and I was reading about people with PTSD. Uh, but this is a big issue that we have nowadays. And the, the psychoanalyst that was talking about it said that many times the PTSD that soldiers are getting when they come back from war is not from them witnessing horrible things in war. It's from them who feel like they're good, you know, good people. Like I'm here to serve my country. I'm a good person. And then they go out in war and then they do something that is so uncharacteristic that it shatters their identity and they cannot reconcile the two. Yeah. And so what the psychoanalyst says is, he's, and he's a very famous one, he says, the way that I help these people is I help them understand that that person who did those horrible things in war is you also. You are all those things. Yeah. How did you reconcile that? Being somebody who's so identified with integrity and Man. being also somebody who cheated. Yeah. Yeah. What they call that our dark passenger, right? Um, so yeah, what I'll, what I'll tell people is, you know, I, I think that I, I don't want to sit here and say everybody makes mistakes, but everybody does make mistakes. Some of them aren't as big as the one I made. Right. Um, but I think that the difference is if you can learn from that and use that to be better, the worst thing in your life can become the best thing in your life if you use it. Right. And if you use it to make you better. Because when we're born, we're a blank slate. The only way we learn is we do something and it works or we do something and it, screw and it blows up in our face and mm -hmm. we say, mm, ain't doing that again, right? So, uh, yeah, learn my lesson. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, I've, I've, I've been in therapy. I have a really good therapist uh, who helped me understand a lot of things about myself too and, and why this actually happened, right? And um, Would you mind sharing some of the things you... you Because I, I, I feel like what you went through... You have a unique opportunity, and I'll tell you why. I think, again, being somebody who went through a divorce, there weren't very many resources or things I could hear about, especially from a male perspective. There just isn't. We tend to be the, um, many times, we tend to be the bad guy. Yeah. Um, and there's two sides to most stories, okay? Yeah. 
And um, I feel like you're in a unique opportunity to help other people in who might be in a situation like yours. And there's a lot more than you think. I talk to when I tell people when I tell guys I was you know I, I was divorced after 15 years. All of a sudden, they feel like they can tell me now. And I, oh, I hear yeah. this shit. And I'm like, wow, this is way more I've gotten, common. I've gotten so many messages from men and women, actually, like who have been on both sides of it. There's been a few that have been disrespectful. But for the most part, people said, you know, even like women who had had that happen to them said, I just wish my husband could have admitted it mm. or just wish he would have taken responsibility for it. Actually, kids, too, of parents who had affairs have said that. Um, I've had some people go on my Instagram and call me a scumbag and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's... Do you think you would have been one of those people? No, I I, I wouldn't... I, you would have thought it. I might have thought it, but I, I don't usually go out of my way to, like, get yeah. nasty about it. Because at the end of the day, I would still go, you know what? I didn't live with them. I don't know what the deal was. So... Right. That's true. Like, I think there's a few no-goes, you know? Yeah. You, you beat your partner. I think that's oh, a no-go. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, the obvious, really obvious. Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah. that... that I think that that's a pretty really nasty shitty thing to do. Kill mm. people. That's a, a yeah. no go. You yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but well, there's more than one to, way to leave a. Uh, uh, there's more more than one way to leave a relationship. That's what I was yeah, alluding yeah. to. That a lot of times that people don't talk about that. I mean, you could emotionally cheat on somebody too. It doesn't always have to yeah. be a physical. In, in act fact, or when that's how it started. Yeah. Right, in, yeah. in fact, when uh, when men and me, women, I, went, I obviously dug, dug deep in all the shit after going through mine. And when men and women are questioned on there's actually one question that the last men and women and generally it's you can predict if a woman is answering this question or if a man is answering the question the question is would you rather your partner fall in love with someone but not have physical sex or contact with them or would you rather that they uh that they don't fall in love with them but they just have meaningless sex men would rather their wives or girlfriends fall in love and not have sex and men are the opposite men would rather their wives and girlfriends, uh, you know, fall in love but not have sex, you know, type of thing. So it's the opposite yeah. for each each gender. Yeah. Um, and they, they, there's all kinds of reasoning behind that and all that kind of stuff. So there's definitely more than one way, though, to to leave a relationship. But I wanted to ask you, like, going through these therapy sessions, because I know me, the, the two years post-divorce, ooh, there's a lot of shit I learned about myself. You know what's myself. so funny? Everybody said it takes two years until you're back to normal. Mm. You know what I mean? And this is, it really is about two years since all this shit started. Starting to you feel know? like you're coming out of the clouds? Yeah, I start to feel like I'm getting back to normal. Bro, I was know? walking around like I was in uh, cement. You know, I was I was functioning at 30%. Yeah. And uh, luckily, I, was, I have these these gentlemen right here that yeah. I was working with that kind of held me up. But what did you learn about yourself going through, te- through to therapy? Like, what are some of the what are some of the things you learned uh, through this whole process? That, um, well, one, you talk about PTSD. Mm-hmm. My therapist said you, you have... Well, there's an actual, there's another term for it when it comes to bullying, but she's like, you basically have PTSD from bullying, you know? Oh, I believe um, that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, I, I saw when we first talked And no it. disrespect, like, I'm not trying to put on the same level as our military members or anything like that. Like, I, I don't want to be sound disrespectful. You know, I think it's called AP, I can't remember the acronym for it. There's a specific one for bullying, okay? And one of the, one of the reasons was, is one of my triggers is, um, one, I have a really difficult time um, speaking my mind to uh, 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 my, my relationship partner. Like I have a very, I have a hard time, especially with like strong women, I have a really hard time speaking up and, and like standing up for myself. I have a really hard time with that. Like, Which it is actually, ironic, I feel like, because yeah. you have mm-hmm. no problem standing up to anybody and everybody yeah, that comes right. after yeah. you. It's a guy, no problem. Yeah. It's a girl. Like I'll literally like, um, like, I, I'm sure I'll get messages making fun of me, but I'll literally like get like sweaty and have like jitters if I have to nervous. say something. Yeah, yeah, get really nervous, you know. And, was this? Um, did you have a good relationship with your mom? Does it come from that, or was it just from? The- I have a good relationship with mom. Uh, I have a great relationship with my mom, but she's very strong-willed, mm-hmm. and um, you know, uh, so that that was probably part of it. Yeah, you know, um, but. I hope mom doesn't listen to this. <laughs> I love mom. Like mom, your mom she listens to my mom. mom. Can we make a T-shirt that says yeah. that? Uh, Green's mom loves hey, my your mom. mom. My mom is a wonderful. Your mom person. listens to my mom. But in all, all seriousness, like I, my mom is a wonderful person. But like, um, I don't respond to criticism well because I, it's, it's. You learn this through therapy. Yeah, you could ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially like, um, um. Like I will get defensive, you know, yeah. and it's, it's, uh, it's a protection mechanism, of course. you know, from, from being younger. And that's like, um, 
you know, going through that, we kind of went through counseling as we went through divorce. And it was like, you know, looking back, you know, and I don't want to say too much about it, but, um, yeah, I, I would at times like, like trying to talk to her where I just like completely freeze up and I like couldn't talk, you know? Uh, and my therapist like, why, well, why well, you need to be able to say something. And I'm like, ah, bathroom. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I learned these things about myself and I'm working on that, you know, um, do working on, you know, being able to, to say what I need to say in a relationship, those sorts of things. Um, cause you're now you're in a, in a pretty committed relationship. You guys, both you and your, your partner now seem like you're very, uh, yeah. And she, she's actually like a part of the reason we work well is, um, she frames things very well. Holly frames things very well. Like, um, for example, um, and I'm not trying to disparage my last relationship. We were young. We got married. We, you know, we just didn't have a lot of tools. You Man, when I mean? you develop a pattern with somebody, after it's hard year, to break. It's very hard to break. Yeah. That pattern. Even if you have the tools after that, it's, it's hard like to when break. you see your sibling after you haven't seen them for five years and you're 12 years old again and now you're fighting yeah. over the same bullshit. It's the yeah. same thing. So she usually frames things not as criticism, but as like suggestions. She's like, you know, like it's not, why did you do it this way? It's, well, have you considered this, mm-hmm. you know? And it's funny how just like that framing things can be difficult, but, or it can make things better. But I mean, you know, she's been with me, like going through all the, all, a lot of this, like the most stressful stuff. And like, it's been stressful for both of us. Cause you know, she's from fucking lane. <laughs> <laughs> so she's, she's from, after um, you, man. uh, from Australia. So, you know, she moved, moved her whole life over here. You know, that's, that's very stressful. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like with I was a guy, with a guy going through a lot of shit too. A lot of I'd be, shit. I'd be scared to live with you, yeah. bro. Well, and, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> probably. Well, trust me. A and lot she's of my, hot. you're definitely moving up. You're moving <laughs> up on, you know, you're, so, you're leveling up on that one. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fuck dude. Well, you must she, be putting it down really well or something. <laughs> <laughs> something like God. That. <laughs> Holly is such a reserved person. If she hears, if she hears you say that, her face would be the color of that shirt okay. right there. No, so, no disrespect. Yeah, 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 yeah. she seems like a you guys are better. She's yeah, great. no, she's awesome. Um, so and you guys got together shortly after uh, the divorce, right? No, I was still going through it. You're still going through uh, it. Yeah. So it's yeah. So well, you you openly admitted that. You openly said that that what it, she was the one, right? Didn't you say yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, people yeah. will put two and two together. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. So, I've, I've seen you communicate um, that. You know, do you do you because you know? And uh, first off, I want to commend you on on uh, being as honest as you are right now. I, I, that's a very difficult thing to do, and mm-hmm. uh, I really appreciate it. I think a lot of people are going to get a, learn a lot of, uh, about you and a lot about maybe their own situations from this. And you know, saying what you're saying about your difficulty speaking to strong women and how that would make you freeze up, and how that's you know probably the result of you know your past bullying and stuff like that. Do you fear? maybe being manipulated by women? Do you feel like, oh shit, now I'm in this vulnerable position. I'm with this woman. I, I'm really in love with her. Is that something you have to work through? Like, am I going to be manipulated? Am I going? Is this going to be a problem? Um, It definitely could be a problem. I have been manipulated by people, not specifically women, but just in general, mm. you know, because I tend to be a really trusting, um, like I give everybody the benefit of the doubt and it bites me in the ass quite a bit. Mm. Um. Again, I don't want to get into specifics, but let me just say that if she was trying to manipulate me, it would already happen because <laughs> <laughs> nobody would have been around for the last six months of what I went through. Mm. So, um, yeah, I know. Like she and she's like a go getter herself. Like she owns her own business. She, mm. you know, she puts it down. She's um, very motivated. Like we have the same goals. She wants to change the world. You know, she wants to be able to put good information out to people. You know, um, yeah, it's just, you know, sometimes you just click with somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? How much harder would it have been going through this if you hadn't, if you didn't have someone like her there next to you? Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It would have been very difficult. Very difficult. Very, Very difficult. Yeah. So it was, you know, again, it's one of those things that at the end of the day, I'm going to be grateful of all the stuff that happened just because man now it's like now once you're kind of on the other side of it you can go shit if i can get through that Mm -hmm. a lot of other stuff i can get through you know what i mean like it's kind of i talked about this it's kind of like building up confidence in yourself you know what i mean like um you it's like when you 
like when I first started lifting weights, got a little bit bigger, hit some numbers, Mm -hmm. you know, then did a bodybuilding show, won that. Then I did well in school, did well in college, got into a good PhD program, won my pro card. Like each one of those is a big challenge. Big challenge. It's just kind of building, 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 building. And because I had low confidence when I was a kid, but it was building that confidence. And so even when I was going through a lot of this stuff, you know, these business problems, personal problems, friends bailing on me, all this kind of stuff. Um, cause some friends treated me like I was fucking radioactive mm. or friends quotations. Uh, and some straight up st- stabbed me in the back. You want to know, you want to, you want to figure out real quick who your good friend. Oh are. yeah. That happened Go through some real shit like that. fast. Yeah. And, and you'll know, you'll know right away who the real people are. Blessing. Blessing. Have you got to a point where you feel like a lot of this shit you've attracted yourself? hundred percent. So this all started because I didn't deal with shit. Right, because I just kept putting it off. Oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. And I didn't clean up my own messes. Mm. You know what I mean? Holy shit! You know what's interesting about this is that, uh, and again, this is a, a subject that I've gotten into. When you were in this relationship, this 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 marriage, putting things off, uh, those are almost like little lies in the sense that you're not being your you're, true self. You're lying to yourself, and 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 that. It's one of those things like when you break, when you start to break one piece of your of your foundation of who you are, it becomes easier to break another piece. Oh, and yeah. It becomes easier then to for it to shatter. So it's almost like you led yourself down a path of that is a hundred percent correct. Like regardless of stuff that happened and people who may or may not have betrayed me or people who did bad shit to me, I allowed it to happen because I didn't clean up my own shit. You know what I mean? Like I just I situations that weren't where they were supposed to be, I kept saying, it'll get better. It, nothing's going to get better without energy, mm. without putting your, without putting stuff into it. You know what I mean? And and in business saying, oh, this will, this will, no, it's not going to take care of itself, you know? And then when it got to the point where, you know, I was in a bad place and I started like lying about things and all that kind of stuff, like then it just created this mess. Yes, some people took advantage of me. Some people stabbed me in the back, but I the situation I created allowed that stuff to happen Mm -hmm. and allowed it to harm me. You know what I mean? If I'd been in a stronger position, it wouldn't be able to happen. Since you've had this awareness, have you had a situation that's kind of triggered that where you caught it where you're like, Oh fuck. I'm going to stop this before. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had one yet? Like now that you're aware of this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, like things like this is a landmine. Don't step on it. (laughs) You know? Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, you know, like again, you know, hopefully like, two quotes that I, re- that I really like. I forget where the first one's from, but it's like, something is painful to remind you not to do that shit again, right? So I can tell you, I am never doing that shit again. Like, I had a guy who messaged me. Um, are you, I had a guy are you me- sexting while you're talking to me right now? No, no. no, no. <laughs> are you fucking sexting no, 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 no. on your phone while you're talking definitely to me? Not, definitely not. Because I'm being nice right now. I'm going to go deep not. on the personal shit if you... No, I was... I was uh, <laughs> my, daughter's had, my daughter's had a little bit of a temperature. Oh, okay. And I was, we'll give you, oh, sorry. I was, a pass with the she's kids. At, she's at daycare, and I wanted to make sure that oh, okay. she wasn't... Uh, oh, you she dick. Wasn't now you make me you. feel like a dick. Yeah, you piece of shit. No, it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. It's all So, you know, stuff is... Because I had a guy message me, and he's like... Hey man, I'm almost in the same position you are. Like, you know, uh, I'm in love with this girl, but I'm married. But I, I got this. I'm like, don't do it, dude. Get out. If you're, if you're, if you are, if you can't make it work where you're at, then get out and don't do the affair. I'm telling you, it. You might think like it will bite you in the ass. Not, not even the emotional affair. Like that. You got. You have a very. Even if you uh, don't get caught, it poisons. It poisons you. It poisons, it poisons you. you. I still, every single day I get mad at myself. Every day. Mm. Um, and feel guilty. And, but I can either, I could, like, I had people giving me shit about the Valentine's Day post I wrote about Holly. And I, I said to some people, listen, I, I get, like, I understand. Wait, which post? You can, oh, the oh, real I just, nice I one just, I just wrote one nice about her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, people calling us bad people, whatever. I said, listen, what, what do you want me to, what do you want me to do? Do you, I've said it was my fault. Uh, I'm, I'm, I learn, I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to not make these mistakes again. It was my fault. So what do you, what do you want from me now? You know what it is. Do you, do you want me, do you want me to like lay on hot coals? Do you want me to be miserable the rest of my life? Should I not be able to be with somebody who I love? Like it's because people, what it is, is that you're very straightforward and you're, you're, you're clear 
and people want to see pain. Like they feel like it's almost like you ever been in an argument with someone and you're wrong. You're like, listen, I'm sorry, but it's not enough for them because no. yeah. they want to like feel like, but I don't feel like you're sorry. Well, like, no, I really am. Rip you to shreds. There was, let's, talk, let's talk about the like, like the, the, there the, was this, a, go ahead. There was a lot of pain. It's just, you know, I'm not. What am I going to do? Sit there and whine about the fact that I had an affair? Like nobody's going to feel sorry for me. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So there's no point. Right? Yeah, but you have to at one point, right? At one point, you got to forgive yourself. At one point, you have. Yeah, that to, was hard. Mm-hmm. That was hard. That's the uh, hardest part. I think. Yeah. I think it's easy for us to look at all the shit and then go, "Oh, let's not repeat that again." But really, it's it's rooted in. So so things are painful to remind us not to do that shit again. Mm-hmm. And then you know what Eric Thomas says is uh, when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, that's when we change. Mm-hmm. You know. So there's another quote that has something to do with like when the the pain of remaining a bud became too strong then it bloomed or something like that yeah so, similar type of thing but so yeah but you know what all that shit and you know like Kabir standing over here he basically like uh he became my video guy right as my life was blowing up and i tried to tell him he moved down for me <laughs> and i'm like bro my life's a shit show yeah. you don't want anything <laughs> like, this. it hasn't always been this way bro. i swear <laughs> yeah. there's a yeah. lot of good video content yeah there. yeah, that's, yeah i'm yeah. sure he was yeah. excited after all this yeah he's no, like but, i got the ricky lake of fitness yeah. man. this is <laughs> fucking <laughs> awesome yeah. here, dude. this well, is gonna be well, fucking hey, drama talk, everywhere i mean talk oh, about yeah. i want to hear about bro, i don't even know you are the father yeah. Yeah. I, oh my god i want to hear about though i want the because this is the part that a lot of people don't talk about is the how the stress of that affects you physically, oh mentally, like your sleep, your like, let's, let's talk about that for a second. Like how, how was all that? How, how did you, how did you physically feel? Like how was your sleep? What was your, I'd sleep. Okay. Just cause I was fucking exhausted by the end of every day. Cause I was just emotionally drained every single day, you know? Um, but yeah, like, you know, normally like if I'm like, I was getting ready for raw nationals. Normally if I'm getting ready for a big meet like that, like when I have my training session, I've looked at my training session. I know what I'm going to do when I get in the gym. I visualize. I didn't even look at my training session until I had gotten warmed up and was getting ready to go. You know, like there was no focus towards that. I didn't even think about Raw Nationals till probably a week before it happened. You know, and I put up a post, uh, I think two days ago, about my last deadlift attempt at Raw Nationals. I actually ended up squatting 655, got called on depth. I still think it was a good squad. But <laughs> um, they had misloaded the bar. Like I called for 650 and they actually put an extra five on one side and I didn't get a relift. But what? Yeah. Listen, you know, shit happens, right? People make mistakes. Like the guy who misloaded it actually came up and apologized and he felt really bad. I was like, again, now having gone through that, like this is a microcosm, right? It's Mm. like, Mm. hey, man, I don't think you tried to purposely like mess me up, right? He's sitting there loading thousands of times over the course of a week. Like shit happens. Wow. Mm. So just a lot of shit happens to you, though. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck, man. So. But like I um, and then I'd strain my pec like a week out, so I had to take a token bench, and I was like, you know what? I kind of so I refocused myself and I said, okay, now would be an excuse to mentally check out. So I was like, let's fucking get a deadlift PR. I had no I, a week out from the meet. I you were there. I missed five eighty five on a deadlift, didn't I? Yeah, I missed five eighty five on a deadlift. I pulled seven sixteen on my last pull. Oh wow! I just I had I just. I funneled everything I had. I just, all the rage, passion, love, hate, everything I had, and I just put it in that one lift. I'm like, I'm fucking not missing this lift. I'm going to go home happy, damn I it. saw that lift. That was yeah. a good lift yeah. for you. You can see you, you dropped to your knees yeah, after. Was, that was such a lot a of emotion with that. Oh, you know? I bet, I bet. I went backstage and Holly goes, where the fuck did that come from? Yeah. So I, I don't know, you know? <laughs> but it's like, you know, I kind of look at that as, I try to use that stuff as like, how can I re-challenge myself, refocus mm-hmm. my stuff? Because, you know, people out there, yeah, you got your plan A and whatever, but plan A sometimes is going to fuck up, you know? Yeah. So you better be able to take that and go, okay, how can I refocus myself to something else, right? So the best thing that's come out of a lot of this shit is, you know, we're talking desperation makes for great motivation, mm. right? So when all these business things went down, these personal things went down, uh, I was having a lot of monetary problems as well. Uh, Because everything is connected, right? And um, so my friend uh, Peter Baker, I've known him for six, seven years, and he he does like a lot of fitness writing. He's like, "Have you ever thought about writing a book?" At this point, I'm like, "Fuck it, let's do it." You know, we wrote we so I we started a book on contest prep. We've wrote it in eight weeks, two hundred and sixty two, two hundred and sixty four pages, I think it is. 
We wrote in eight weeks. Oh, he it's just it almost out. finished. It, yeah, you like, seem to you seem to run I was crushing. You seem to run on one speed, like you know, fast forward turbo mm-hmm. all the time. <laughs> which which uh, you know, you know, this is a quote that you know we 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 say all the time on Mind Pump, which is your your greatest strength could be your greatest weakness. Yeah, oh yeah. Do you have another speed? Like, do you ever think to yourself, maybe I need to like learn how to like. You get the get the parasympathetic to kick, kick yeah. in, to chill, to like. Yeah, mm. so that's actually something that Holly's been really good at is getting me to be like, you know, take walks there's, on there's, the beach. There's more do some yoga, bro, <laughs> yeah, or what? Yeah. There's more to life than like you know. We want to do something really great, but if you're dead at forty because you're just burning yourself into the ground, you know, um, and also like, oh, I. Oh, uh, being objective with yourself and trying to make qualitative statements, but I was never a bad dad, but I would always be distracted. You know, I was on my phone. I was, you know, I'd always, okay, what do I have with business? What do I have with business? What do I have with business? Why'd you choose those words? What's that? That you're not a bad dad. Why would you even say that? Well, because I should have done a lot better Mm -hmm. Uh, when my, when my kids were, when, when Robert was young. Is that your um, own, is that your own guilt that you put on yourself or is that other people telling you? Just, just, there were reasons I, I was distracted. One, you know, being unhappy and, and whatnot, and but, you know, being very focused on what I wanted to do with my life and my business and whatnot. And, you know, like, Holly's actually been very good at being able to say, when we're working, we're working. When we have, if we have the kids, we're with the kids. Mm. You know, that sort of stuff. Um, which I was never very good at. And I'm still, I still have my moments. Like, I'll still pick up my phone and kind of but i've gotten much better about being able to say you can go away for a little while there's nothing nothing, nothing that's going to happen in the next 30 minutes that's going to change my life so you you better dad now than you were before do you think i think so my friends have commented on it i've experienced i experienced that that's actually a common thing many times is after doing something like that uh you reevaluate everything and start to try to be a lot better i think my relationship with my kids is a lot better uh, i think so too I want, I want to hear you explain something that uh, I just can't wrap my brain all the way around. And you're a science guy. You're a great guy to ask this. And you kind of made a statement kind of glazing over it, which was when you did this deadlift, you you pulled all this energy, this anger, this sad, mm-hmm. all this stuff all into the And you had this amazing lift. I don't know. What the fuck is that? I don't know. I, it's hard to describe. And do you, do you mean, believe maybe that like – our, our thoughts and all these things like that could actually oh, hell yeah in, i mean like i'm not gonna deadlift 800 pounds just because i will it to happen you know what i mean but within a certain to get the absolute most out of your performance you've got to be able to pull that you know what i mean uh same thing like um i feel like when you, you know, when you when you have moments, i put up a post the other day i said you know champion i think it's something like champions or winners find a way to find gas in the tank that's empty mm. you know what i mean like just can you reach down for that? Do you have that other gear? Yeah. You know what I mean? And a lot of, um, I don't want to call myself elite because people will give me shit about it, but a lot of elite athletes will talk about that. You know, the, like Jordan, he, like he would say, you know, when it was crunch time, they'd like, he'd have these amazing performances and people would be like, how did you like, and he would even be like, I don't, I don't know. You know, he's like the, the, the gold to just look big. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that hyper focus. You know what I mean? Mm. And you, but you can't have that gear all the time because otherwise, you know. There's a reason why those limiters are there. You know, you're, you're. Uh, uh, we all have these like these these limiters on our bodies yep. to prevent us from hurting ourselves. But if your mind and your 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 mind believes that it is a matter of life or death, then at that point it becomes you know the the risk is okay now because this is life or death. You're trying to mm-hmm. escape the, the the teeth of a lion or whatever. So would you say at that moment when you did that lift that you literally felt like yes life or death yeah like i mm. like i can get my hair on the back of my neck to stand up you know before i go for a big lift like that yeah but i can't do it every time mm. you know like i'll be pretty amped up but to get to that like literally 100% completely focused you've got as much adrenaline running through your system as you possibly can you know like that's and to be under control too that's the hard part Right mm-hmm. to be able to do that, but still execute your technique and be under control—that's what's really hard. Have you fucked with meditation at all yet? 
not as much as I probably should. Because I, I believe that's learning to control that right there. Yeah. A lot of that is 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 learning to figure that when when to release that and and when to calm yourself when you need to be calm. Because a lot of times our bodies go into this flight or fight situation when it's probably not always optimal anymore. We're not always being chased by lions like Sal's talking about. A lot of times it's just some bullshit stress that somebody else has put on you and you don't want to go into that ah mode yeah. and you need to be able to calm. And then there's times when you need to yeah. call upon it and rip fucking 700 something pounds off the floor. <laughs> well, and, and that's a great point. Like that's part of the reason we're li- not probably not living as long, right? Because like we get that adrenaline dump, that fight or flight response, but it's because we're late for something yeah. or, right. you know, mm-hmm. Your, your kids throwing up, or and that or, shit didn't that exist thousands of years well, ago. You well, know? well, what ha- what happens with a lot of people is we say we don't like it, but the reality is, and I can hear this in your voice, you fucking love it. Mm-hmm. Oh, like, I love, you I love, love that the feeling. Fucking, not not when I'm stressed out, but like the controlled stress of like I tell people like uh, well, that was, shit feels good. Catecholamines, oh, cortisol, it makes you feel nothing better than that. Right. The, the, well, there was um. Did you guys ever watch The Ultimate Fighter? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So do you remember the season of Sarah versus Hughes? Do you remember that? It was like season oh, five. Oh, back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So War Machine. Now he's fucking oh. weirdo. But there was a great line in this. I don't know if you ever caught it from Matt Sarah. And like uh, John Copenhaver is like getting sick before his fight. Like got a five-gallon bucket, like throwing up. And he's like, man, I can't. I can't do this no more. I, I, like, I, I. And Matt Sarah's like, dude, what are you talking about? That is the feeling of being alive. You care about something that much that it's making you physically ill. He's like, most people never get that. It's like, you should be grateful for that. <laughs> and that totally changed my mind about how I approach competition and when I'm nervous or anything like that. But I'm like, when I start getting those nerves for competition, I get excited. Like, I'm anxious, but I'm fucking excited. Because I know that that's part of what is going to make me do well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's a good thing. I perceive it as a good thing. And people, you know, the same thing. They'll talk to elite athletes and elite athletes, everybody gets nervous before competition, but it's how you perceive it that totally. makes the difference. You know where totally. they have a hard time, though, is separating this addiction that you we have, that a lot of athletes have for that rush that we're talking about, how to separate that from life. And what ends up happening is you seek out things, you self-sabotage, and you don't realize it because subconsciously you like that feeling you like that fucking feeling you like putting mm. yourself in a corner mm. you like being the underdog you like oh, being challenged see, he's already just psychoanalyzed me right to the bone yeah <laughs> i mean i mean paul said it my my one of my good friends paul Ramilla, he said you do best when you're the underdog when you're when you're when people don't think you can do it when your back's against the wall that's when you're at your best he's like so you but i mean like people give jordan a hard time right because he would like take anything you put the best thing you could have done with jordan is just don't say anything yeah. don't even give him a compliment just don't say anything because anything you said he was going to turn that around and somehow use it as you're the enemy and you're disrespecting him well right? I'm a, i use i put a jordan quote up yesterday i'm a huge jordan fan but i'll tell you that that the things that i quote or i think or i love about him is the athletic side of him but that guy had a pretty fucked up personal life himself he's got a lot of drama and shit that nobody talks about we celebrate what he did on the court because he's arguably the greatest of all time revolutionized the game but uh, i bet you and you were in his shoes right that's right (laughs) Uh, i'm a big fan for sure but i bet if we were to psychoanalyze him and sit him down i bet you that motherfucker's got a lot of regret in his life and probably isn't the best father and probably has a lot of shit so you know, sometimes when we attach our, ourselves to these these professional athletes, and and the, I'm learning this even more now that we're in this podcasting world because we get the privilege to travel and meet a lot of really brilliant minds and talented, smart people. And the more I see this, the exceptional people, the more I see the dysfunction too, because what it takes that to be so except you got to be kind of crazy a little bit to be so great at this. But you always end up there's always a cause and effect. You know, you're super, super great at this sport because you've dedicated your whole life to it. Well, what's the, what's the sacrifice when you dedicate your whole life to this craft? Well, you're probably not going to be the best father. Well, you're probably not going to be the best husband. You're probably not going to be the... And so at it's one... It's tough. Yeah, it's fucking really well, tough. So, I, so what I think is I think you have... Uh, when you, when you've, you have the ability to tap into something that can give you that laser focus, that can give you success... You've tapped into a power. I think that all people have. We just don't all know how to harness it or how to, how to touch upon it. The problem is falling in love with that feeling and then that feeling 
being a, used like a drug where it's addicting and then you place yourself in situations that are not good for you but because they elicit that feeling now you're in them all the time and so you see this all the time with like Adam said these very successful individuals who have some fucked up other shit and it's literally because they can't separate the two well I'll give you an example of that like you know like I thought about when I injured my back and I'm like man what is this is it like like where's my identity now fortunately I have other things in my life like I'm also known as a scientist or a uh, a writer or sure. content I have other things I can fall back on but like you know for some people like Brian Brian Carroll in the book he talks about like he walked out of a, a doctor's office um, after like the guy just basically blew him off and was like yeah we can do surgery but you're never gonna be able to lift heavy again regardless and Brian's like I had my Glock 23 in my glove box and I was seriously thinking about ending my life mm. you know he talks about this in the book and it's because like you said like that's you love that high that is your identity. And if you can't get it, like some people like this isn't true, but what's the point? Right. right. But that's like, um, I heard a quote one time and I forget who said it, but it was like, invent yourself, then reinvent yourself. Right. So that's like part of it. So who are you now? You've been reinvented. Yeah. I think I'm going back to more of what I was. Oh shit. Five, don't, six years don't ago. Don't say that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> don't say no, that. No, but I like Abraham Lincoln. I have no respect for a man that's no wiser today than he was uh-huh. yesterday. Well, well, with <laughs> with more knowledge. Yeah. So, but I really liked who I was back then. Like I was really, you know, I was focused on the right things. So mm-hmm. I what, think are, what are those things? Um being involved with the people I love, uh, working really hard, knowing the limits of that, and just being involved in positive shit. You know what I mean? Like, um, contributing. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what I want to do. I, I'm not going to sit here and say I don't like money. Everybody likes of course. money. But I like money more so. Be, I mean, I, I didn't drive it today, but I've still got my grad school car. You know, I mm-hmm. still drive my 2003 Oldsmobile Like Yeah. I look at money as, some, and I don't dog anybody who likes nice stuff. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I look at money as that gives you me. You got to look at me like that, bro. <laughs> 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 You look over at my he J's knows. and shit over there. I see you, bro. I see you, bro. Uh, so well, money money has no. It gives you the opportunity to do cool shit. Is the way I look at it. Like, but it's worth nothing if you're if you if your soul feels corrupted. That's and, and, right. You know, and we know that. We know that. There's a. I could I could name off. You know, I don't know how many celebrities who who killed themselves yeah. and they had all the money in the world. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a saying like. They say money doesn't buy a j- happy- happiness, but I don't see this motherfucker frowning, and it's like a guy in a fifty foot yacht with a bunch of beautiful women on it. Yeah, you know right, what I mean? Right. But I know what you're saying. Like, yeah. um, but for me, like, if I have more money, it gives me more freedom to be creative and take risks and do stuff that's cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which mm-hmm. is what I really like. You know. Um, so at the end of the day, like, you know, I have very few hobbies. I love what I do. Um, you know, I like to shoot guns. I like to go fishing. I like to spend time with my girlfriend and friends, you know, pretty much the same shit that everybody else does, minus the guns and the fishing, because not everybody's into that. Uh-huh. But uh, I'm with libertarians. I'm pretty sure that we're all, <laughs> although hey, you guys live in the I, I, People's Republic of I, California. I, I, I love as long I love, th- I love that you love things and that you can do them and you should be able to. That's what I love more yeah. than yeah. And I think that should be for everybody. But, you know, you, you're, you're, you've got this relationship that you're in now that you've referred to several times, and, and it's obvious that you this is a place you feel like you're you're in a good space with this individual and you have your do you have your kids half time now are you are you uh, uh, yeah i get uh, i have part custody part custody yeah and so i'm assuming when you have the kids around you have uh, you know your girls around at the same time so you yep. have holly with the kids and mm-hmm. how does that working out for you yeah well that could be a, that could be I, i'm going through that too that's a, that can be a, a trans, uh, what's the word it well the fortunate thing for, is they're 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 real young so you know they don't <sighs> I don't want to say the wrong thing here. Are they younger than five? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, they, you know, it's, we've done a lot of work on, okay, how do we do this? You know, so it's, you know, Holly is just somebody who loves and cares for the kids mm-hmm. and she's not mom. She's not intended to replace mom in any way, shape or form. She is just a caretaker who really loves the kids. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was 
it was uh and she's accepted know. that role she said hey i want to yeah. be in their lives as well yeah yeah well we we you know that's it's, special it's mm-hmm. it's hard to like it's a very it's an adjustment period for anybody on all ends the kids me her you oh, know yeah. um but uh yeah, they they get along great, you know. So. Does she want kids of her own? I know you guys are. I mean, this may be too early to ask, but you know. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know you were gonna get a therapy session today. Yeah. With you, you're talking to mom. Well, He's no, like, I thought know, we we're gonna argue about mom, IIFYM. Mom, 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 I, thought, I, thought, I thought this was I'm a down. macro we'll talk. Get that, we'll get there too. We'll talk about your favorite. <laughs> stuff. Yeah, we, 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 we haven't gotten that far. We'll cross that bridge yeah, when we get there. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. gotten that far. Well, no, these but, are just the challenges that you go through when you're yeah, in a relationship yeah, sure. after having. I mean, I've I've gone. I mean, these are things that we talk about. I hey, talk about my girlfriend all the time. Speaking of of macro talk and stuff like that, I feel like uh, your posts, some of your posts lately. I thought, yeah, you, did I see a performance a of Diet Coke tune. thing, and did I see some shit like talk that? Talk about going? my. I talk about the microbiome. Yeah, did I see? I feel some like that? Holly's influencing what? you in, in other cool. ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I feel like me. Holly might be a real mind pub listener. Yeah. I don't Um. Well. You know, let's talk there, about that. So, well, now one thing there was actually. A, <laughs> oh, okay. well, hang on, you don't even know. Things just come right off the cuff. Uh, I'm just you watching know. your brain turn right now. Yeah, you yeah, go, yeah, go, yeah, go, yeah, go, you go. gotta think, bro. Yeah, criticism. You just activated my PTSD. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now I gotta defend myself. Uh, uh, so uh, there was a study that came out recently where they actually looked at like uh, flexible dieting versus uh, just straight meal plan. They actually found. Uh, both groups actually had uh, some deficiencies, um, which actually, by the way, it's really hard to eat like and not have some kind of not like frank deficiency, but like a small deficiency yeah. of micronutrients. Like it's it's actually very, which ones were the eating, more like, common ones? Which um, nutrient deficiencies do they find? Iron is one that's it's pretty common. Uh, vitamin D pretty common. D is a big one. Yeah. Um, you know, especially even if people are eating enough if they live in you know cold weather where they're inside a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, what's it? Another one? Vitamin K, magnesium. Uh, sometimes, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, but it found that you know the actual flexible dieting group was a little bit better for micronutrient distribution because if you're just eating a set meal plan, they have more variety. More variety. Yeah. yeah so, I what what I what I will qualify things with is I will say when I say that you know I'm a fan of flexible dieting and people track their macros, I'm not saying this. This other stuff isn't important either. I'm just saying that your total daily calorie intake and macronutrient intake is the most important thing. That doesn't mean that everything else is unimportant, right? So what I'm saying is this is our first tier. Let's start here, making sure your calories are correct, then your macros, then let's start worrying about some of this other stuff, right? So we, we tier it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, of course, micronutrients are important. Um, I've just never seen... Like, as far as the gut microbiome goes... Yeah, what do you think about all that? Because the science on that's fucking compelling, right? Well, it's, it's coming it's, out and it's, it's pretty awesome. It's getting there. So what I would say is we know certain things influence the gut microbiome certain ways. What we don't have a great understanding of yet is, okay, it changed gut flora. Is that a bad thing? Is it a good thing? Is it net neutral? That's, that's some of the things that have more to be elucidated. And I think we'll probably get those answers in the next five to ten years. Uh, actually, one of the, the people I did my PhD in the same lab, uh, she was there when I was, uh, Suzanne Devcota. Mm-hmm. She actually works on the mi- gut microbiome now. And um, yeah, she like got a study published in Nature and she's a professor at UC Berkeley. I think she's badass. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, she was actually one of the first that showed that Splenda changed the gut microbiome. Yeah. So yeah. I know, so I know one of the, one of the things you talk about with flexible dieting is how, um, from a psychological standpoint, it can be easier for people because uh, obviously, if you're if you're following a meal plan where it's the same fucking rotation mm-hmm. every single day, that can not only be monotonous, but uh, it can. Uh, I mean, psychologically speaking, much it can be much more difficult for someone versus having a target and being able to rotate food so long as they hit the target. So that's that psychological piece that you yeah. talk about a lot, and you say that's real important. Well, and I say let's just. Let's keep in mind, like, what we're talking with. Like, for most people, they could get 80, 90% of the health benefits if they just found a way to eat fucking less. You know what I mean? Like, like, am I going to sit here and say, like, you should eat Pop-Tarts and Skittles and shit? No, 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 no. For most people, telling them to eat more vegetables, more fruits and vegetables, less starches, um, you know, limiting, uh, sat- well, not saturated fat intake, but, you know, limiting some fat, like... That's fine advice. The problem is, is then when you take that too far, and this is what fucking everybody in nutrition does, right? 
Because if you look like the concept of paleo, it's fine. Eat more fruits and vegetables. Um, eat less uh, carbohydrates. Eat more whole foods. Eat more meat. That's fine. If you did that, you'd probably be, end up being a healthier person. It's when you take it to the point of, oh, well, paleo didn't eat beans and they, they don't eat dairy and all that kind of shit, you know? And then, and then it's like, dogma. okay. Yeah, it's dogma. Exactly. That's why we attack them all. Mm-hmm. Right. We, got, so, we, we have, we have no one favorite. Yeah. We talk shit about all of them for that and, exact and, reason. And, and, it, it's the dogma the aspect of it. I mean, here's the thing. Like, you talk about the, psycho, the psychological aspect of, of uh, the benefits of maybe IIF lamb versus a, you know, eat the same thing every, every day type of thing, which was so prevalent in bodybuilding in particular. Yeah. How do you feel about um, – and I know this is a, a, a loose term, but I think you know what I'm talking about when I refer to food this way. How do you feel about highly processed food then in the diet? From a psychological standpoint, because they are they are engineered to be highly palatable in ways that you don't. Oh yeah, I'm not saying that it's not highly palatable and make you want to eat more of it. Now I I, I stop short of saying addictive because I think that that's a fine too strong of a term. Sure, but um yeah I mean shit people are like oh sugar's addictive because it activates this. Well then you can say anything that you like is addictive. You know what I mean? But you can but, I think you can say that. I, I know I mean I I had a friend maybe, that was yeah maybe so. Um, I think it's more about the personality of the person that disposes them to being addicted, right? So for some people, I mean, for some people, I said like Holly's a great example. She does not do moderation. Mm. I literally have a lockbox in my house with the with the treats in it. Well, I can go once a day and get myself some Reese's cup or whatever I want. You know, she 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 can't moderate. It could be receded. Like we're, we're actually going to do a funny video about this, but. Yeah, like I have to keep the lock box locks because she doesn't have that. When I, that when I can't. That, I can't either. If it's in my house, it, I'll, I'll eat it for sure. Yeah, and I, and, and so, I attribute that though to the way I ate as a kid. For so, I mean, we, we could have cereal in the middle of the day. We could yeah. have candy bars, ice cream for. I ate ice cream for dinner for fucking twenty years, man. Yeah. So for some people, like you know, I'm not a, I'm a pragmatist before all things. So for some people, if you know yourself and you can't do that. And fine, I encourage people to try and, you know, deal with the issues that would cause them to maybe not be able to moderate that so that maybe they can, you know, be able to. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to just cut foods out of your life for the most part because you're going to be exposed to it at some point. And so at that point, you kind of got to, sure. okay, be able to deal with it in a certain way. But if you know this about yourself, then okay, you know. Well, I mean, here's, um, so, uh, you know, a great book that I read, uh, Wired to Eat. I'm not <laughs> sure, sure if you're familiar with Rob Wolf, a very interesting individual, but he makes some very good points in the book. And he talks about, and bear with me now, he, he talks about uh, here it uh, comes the ease of access to pornography. And he talks about it because he's using it as an analogy for what's happened with food. And he says, you know, we have pornography on the internet now. It's extremely accessible. Wait, there's porn on the internet? Uh, that's, I, I thought that's why they invented the internet. Hang on. I'll be back in two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two minutes. So, uh, uh, hey now, <laughs> hey, hey, this is, uh, but it's extremely accessible, and the, uh, the, you know, obviously the male brain in particular is stimulated by novelty, and so you've got these kids looking at picture after picture after picture, and you know, when we were kids, pornography was hard to come by. I mean, yeah. you, you had a magazine, you could probably work for that shit, damn yeah, it, exactly. Had to and, go steal from dad. Right? And, but what's happened now is that the when you look at erectile dysfunction among men, the the age group where the, you're seeing the fastest rise, which is scary and exceptional is in men who are in their 20s which didn't even yeah. exist before and it's because they've literally wired their brain desensitized, it. desensitized. doesn't process or highly processed food kind of do that a little bit i mean i know i can speak uh anecdotally and say i have completely experienced that how do you feel that about that with it because we are we are eating engineered foods that yeah. just you don't you don't get that kind of flavor i mean look if you stop drinking monster drinks today <laughs> i bet you if you stop drinking them for two months and then you taste it again, it would taste so much sweeter than it does. No, no, that's true. That is 100% true. Now, I don't know if it's so much a brain thing, but the the palate is very adaptable. For example, if you take people who, like Indian people, who eat a lot of spice and you have them eat American food, they can't even taste it. Bland. Because it's they're used to so much spice and flavor. Yeah. Um, if you take somebody who's like a really high salt diet and you have them eat a low salt diet, they can't taste it. Mm-hmm. You know, so same thing. If somebody's used to eating a lot of sugary stuff, they have a hard time tasting stuff that's less. So yes, absolutely. Like you can you can change the palate. The good thing is you can change it back too. You know, um, but yeah, it's 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 really interesting about all that stuff. You know, I try not to be too dogmatic on any one thing. I guess I guess where I try to make the distinction is, you know, again my my problem is with people taking it too far. You know, and people saying, well, you know. 
insulin. Insulin is the cause of obesity and all this. I'm like, well, if that was true, then we would have these studies where calories are controlled and people eat more carbs or more sugar and they lose less weight. And that's not what happens. Now, I'm not saying that it's a good idea to eat a lot of sugar when you diet. You'd be very hungry. You wouldn't be that satisfied. Right. But can you have some sugar and still lose fat? Yes, unequivocally, right? But is it a good idea to eat more vegetables and things that are filling? Absolutely, right? The problem is, and I had this the other day, people people, people are, if you ever, I told this to somebody, I said, you ever want to find out how dumb the average person is? Try to sell something and then look at the questions you get. Like, just, just like, God bless customer support for different companies because I can't even imagine what some of these companies get. But, uh, you know, I have said repeatedly that I think a ketogenic diet has several applications. I don't think it's superior for fat loss because the research is pretty damn clear on that, that if you equate calories and protein, it's not superior for fat loss. Yeah. Now, if you like to eat that kind of diet, if you prefer that and you can be sustained with that, then by God, that's fine. Here, I'll tell you what my problem is. I think, I think let me finish. Let me oh, finish. Yeah, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but what somebody said to me on Twitter is like, that's not true. I lost 50 pounds on the ketogenic diet. I said, please tell me where I said it didn't work. What I said was it wasn't superior. If you like it, then by all means do it, right? So that's the same thing. Like everybody, people, what, you, what I say and what people hear mm -hmm. It's two different things. Well, here's here's where I think uh, your message sometimes gets uh, misconstrued. Okay? When, I yell, like, when I yell at people, call them stupid. Maybe, maybe. No, no. Uh, we can <laughs> talk about it. that, that too. But that's it. not where I was going. Uh, you 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 talk about how you know they were testing the ketogenic diet versus other diets. Calories were were controlled. Protein was controlled. No difference in weight loss, which is yes, it's true. But I think where, where things get misconstrued is either you're not acknowledging. Outwardly, because I know you would not. If I bring it up now, you'll acknowledge it. But you're not acknowledging the Seems the very subjective. Presumptuous of him, doesn't it? Well, it could be. You're not <laughs> you're not addressing the subjective satiating effects that a lot of people get when they eat a lot of fat and they don't eat a lot of carbs. And so people say keto works better for a lot of people, not because it makes your body burn more body fat, but because I don't want to eat as much. That's a major factor in a diet is how hard it is for you. Yes. Well, especially when when we really dive into all this shit, that all the stuff, that all these semantics that we argue over is not even the big factor. The biggest factor is the psychological piece. 80% of people, no matter how fucking smart you are, no matter what great diet you put them on, is still failing. Yeah. We everybody gains the weight right back. Ninety five percent. All right, yeah. I was say, that's a yeah. that's a that's a low ball at eighty to ninety five percent. And yeah. why is that? And it's because there's a psychological issue that we're completely ignoring. Yeah, that nobody talks about. Nobody talks. We about all that. argue. We all well, get, we all get in camps. Yeah. Uh, paleo, keto, IIFYM, and we want to argue over who's is better and get into the science of it. When none of that fucking matters, because what really, if none of these people make the choice to follow anything for longer than six weeks, then it's none of it's going to really help anybody. So it's I always find it comical that we all get into you know all the smart guys get all these debates over who's smarter, who's more right with the science when no one's addressing the real elephant in the room, which is these people aren't get diving into why. They're why they want all this shit, the psychological piece. So none of that stuff matters. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, it's not just a huge factor. I think it's the it's the factor. Cuz here's the deal. Here's here's where, where I think we make mistakes with nutrition is that we believe that we can command people to do something and then that's going to work. Like we have the answer like, okay, here's what you got to do. Eat less calories, follow this macro or follow this diet and you'll lose weight. We can't even fucking command ourselves. We, we can't even tyrannize ourselves. How many times have you told yourself, I'm going to do that and then you don't? And you're going to tell other people to do shit? Right. just doesn't work that way. So, I mean, how do you feel about that that piece of it, that psychological piece? Like, uh, and and what, how how big of a role that play? I know you coach a lot of people. Although I would say that there's probably some self selection bias with the people you coach because I'm sure a lot of them are pretty fucking serious. You're probably not getting the average person, right? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna usually, you're gonna attract usually. somebody like me to you because I yeah. I want to know more of the deeper science. Yeah, like, you, you know, you're not just with coaching. It's not just your knowledge. You're selling yourself. Like somebody's not gonna hire somebody they don't like. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? For the most part. Well, they're going to fire him pretty quick. Well, there's a lot of stuff to unpackage there, but I, what I'll say is in terms of satiety, fat is more satiating per gram. On a per calorie basis, it's pretty close. Sure. Depending on the carbohydrate source as well. But it also is very individual. 
Some people do better uh, calorie control wise on a low fat diet. Some people do better with calorie control on a high fat diet. Would not disagree with you, absolutely. And and, and you know, some people say, you know what? I don't crave fat that much. Mm-hmm. If you give me enough carbohydrate, I'm a happy camper, and vice versa, right? It really doesn't matter because I mean, you can make fat from carb, and you can make car- well, I can't really make carb from fat other than the glycerol backbone, but more so fat spares carbohydrate. But that's another conversation. Um, one that nobody gives a shit about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go back to talking about. I care. Go back I mean, to talking yeah, about. Yeah. Well, no, I just, I, I just, I just mean this is again like if I can make a porn reference, you know, <laughs> care, but, um, they make that connection. Yeah, you know, yeah. they make so, that connection. Going missionary, but yeah. I spared that for you know yeah. doggy style. So yeah. oh, uh, there's that glycerol backbone there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that glycerol back. Slide it right in. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I got ketones for you. Yeah. Um, I what I would say is that. That's part of it, right? Is we don't know what the difference is, and part of it's probably psychological, is what people prefer. I think also psychological is the emphasis on just the dieting, just the weight loss. Nobody give talks about weight maintenance after they've lost the weight. That is never discussed. Mm-hmm. Very few people actually discuss that. Yeah. And that is actually the major problem. Nine out of, or sorry, six out of every seven overweight or obese people will lose a significant amount of, the, of body weight in their life. The problem is that they can't keep it off. Yeah, yeah. We don't have a weight loss pro- yeah. Yeah. Right problem. No, we don't. And we that, lose weight. And all then the time. again, it's mm-hmm. you know, and they all followed something to get there. So there was something that was successful for them. But really, was it successful if they didn't keep the weight off? And that's what I tell people. I'm like, don't don't show me your don't show me your after picture. Right. Show me your after picture six months later right. or twelve months later. Right. Your right. after and after. I, picture. We get all these people like the the Dr. Urshan weight loss clinic here. Which is people are like, oh wow, it's a magical fat burning diet. He puts people on 800 calories a day. Of course, you fucking lost fat. Like, they let me see it a year from now after you've rebounded. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the ones they don't put up. How do you feel about um, some of the science that's coming out with fasting? How do you feel about? Have you practiced fasting? Have you tried it? I have not. Um, Holy shit! You know who should totally do fasting? You, you, yeah. you. Jesus Christ! Fasting and meditation may change your life. Oh my your god, life, bro! Yeah. You have no idea. Uh, Just for the experience. Uh, well, there's a there's a there's a massive psychological piece from fasting that you, if you try it, you'll know. And I'm not talking about 12 or 15 hours. I'm talking uh-huh. about like 48, 72 hours. And you're not talking but, about some woo woo psychological thing. You're talking about this real connection that we've made as humans to food. That, to food that we didn't have just a few hundred years What's ago. What's the longest you've ever yeah, gone without food? Monster. Uh, the longest I've ever gone without food, no, 16 hours. Something yeah, like so that. you've never really felt, I mean, you've never felt real, real hunger. You felt cravings. That's an interesting. Well, there is. Um, most people haven't. There is. Once you go through a certain amount of fasting, there's like, you can get actually like a euphoric feeling. Anorexics get this. Yeah. Um, there's like a euphoric feeling associated with it. Um, well, look, uh, but eat, eat, a lot eat. of. Here's my thing. It's like I'm I'm interested in yeah, but don't compare fasting to anorexics because one is a dysfunction. Yeah, and I the know. other one is totally. It would be like me saying, "Hey, I'm eating to gain muscle," and you're like, "Oh, you're just like that." You know, it's like eating when people are 500 pounds overweight or whatever. Um, it, it's and I want to be clear with that because we talk about fasting on the podcast and we're very clear to say fasting is not a weight loss tool. In fact, if you use it for weight loss, you're get, you potentially can set yourself up for those type of behaviors which are not good uh, for all intents and purposes. Yeah, well, and that's that's the that's the big problem. Um is that, I apologize. No problem. Uh, Holly <clears throat> as I told you she's uh had the license issue and I'm trying to she's stuck somewhere. I'm trying to get her an Uber. <laughs> Basically, Lane's like, I need to be more present. I shouldn't be more distracted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the middle of a live podcast. I'm going to text. Oh, yeah. This motherfucker doesn't listen. <laughs> no, yeah. all joking aside, uh, I know, I'm glad you, we, we had a chance to take care of, you know, you had to take care of some stuff. But we were talking about fasting. Um, and I asked you, what's the longest, if you've ever fasted before, you said no. Like, what are your thoughts on fasting, some of the science that's coming out? Well, I guess, um, well, what I hear a lot of now is autophagy. Everybody's all about ta- yeah, ta- autophagy. Yeah. Autophagy. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about you guys, but most of these people talking about this stuff. I'm like, do you actually know what autophagy is? Because yeah. you you keep using this word. I don't <laughs> think it means what you think it means. <laughs> you know, so autophagy is just the the process of basically like cellular degradation, mm-hmm. like breaking down shit that needs to be broken down, getting rid of waste, if you will, lysosomes, you know, proteasome, detox, 
<laughs> <Detox. laughs> yeah. Perfect scientific word. Yeah. Insert Patrick Stewart it, face it, palm. That is. Exactly. It's a good point to, um, to tell people though. That's what they do. That's yeah. how people sell well, products the like that. They, is use, they yeah. attach it to something like that. So it's, if you if you look at um, because I, I looked this up when people started saying this, I'm like, all right, well, let's see if this is something that's you know, mm-hmm. and uh, caloric restriction actually induces autophagy as well. So, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd like I'd like to see a comparison. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Walter Longo is already doing that. Are you familiar with him? Uh, I, I know the name. So he's uh, one of the premier researchers on, or the leading researchers on uh, um, fasting. And so he did a study, fucking remarkable study. I'd like to see it. And actually, the FDA, I believe, is now investigating. He took individuals who had terminal cancer, had them fast for 72 hours, then do their chemotherapy. Mm. And he compared them to. Sensitizes you. And man, the can- far more effective on the cancer and far less side effects. And it protected, it seemed to have protective effects on the healthy cells. And the problem with that is. Telling people not to eat for three days, especially in the context of modern life, is very difficult. Yep. So what he's doing now is he's putting people on what's called a fasting mimicking diet where they eat three to very five low days. calories, mostly fats, so mm-hmm. not, no proteins, no carbohydrates. And uh, they do this over the course of five to seven days. And he's seeing very similar for – all, for all he knows, it, it, so far it seems like it's doing the same thing. Yeah, that's not the first time I've heard that, that um, – uh, Dr. Dom DiGostino. Yeah. Um, he, he studies this with keto, with keto, ketogenic. Diet. Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, hear that, keto zealots? I'm one of my good friends is like one of the main keto researchers. So. <laughs> is he, are, who's stronger, zealots. you or Get him? off a of motherfucker's ass, right? <laughs> so here's a question. Who's smarter, you or Dom, and who's stronger, you or Dom? Wow. Because he's a strong that, motherfucker, too. And question. he's a smart guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's a smart strong guy. He's very handsome, too. Yeah. Very handsome, yeah. 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 Like, I'm inferior in every single way. Wow. <laughs> 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 Although, oh, really? We're going to use as our No, you bite. pull more weight than yeah. he does. You do. I have deadlifted more he, than Yeah, he pulled In competition, off. but I've seen him pull 700 pounds after like fasting for 36 hours. Well, I right. know he did that. After, I know he did 500 and something, which is impressive as fuck uh, after that. He's, but. He used to like barbell row 405 like Dang. for reps. Yeah, he's a strong fucking he's guy. He's a fucking moose. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, so let's talk about fasting for a second. Like, what do you think about that? And would you ever consider incorporating that in, in coaching for people maybe to help them with? I already have people who do intermittent fasting. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I I I just I, okay. Here's the upsides. Here's the downsides. What are those? I, like, well, I mean, if you look at um, you know, my background was in protein metabolism, so I always kind of start there. Uh, but I try not to be too much of a hammer trying to see in the, trying to see nails. Mm. Uh, part of the um, one of the downsides is you can't you can't make up for low protein at one time of the day by overeating at another time of the day. You don't. We don't have any viable. St- protein storage mechanism other than depositing in tissue and there's a max cap to that there's what's called the the muscle full effect right you can only per unit time put so much in okay right so and you have this minimum threshold stimulation and max threshold for amino acids and protein so it's more anabolic to be able to get multiple protein rich high quality protein meals per day now there's a cap to that you know, once you start getting about four or five meals, it seems like it's you're just trying to throw more stuff in sure. that's already full. Um, and there does seem to be something to be said for eating a meal and kind of let, letting the, for lack of a better term, system reset. Mm. Um, if you eat too frequently, it's not optimal for animals. Almost as if it becomes desensitized in a way. Yeah, we call it the muscle full effect. But okay. yeah, the... the I don't know if I want to call it desensitized, right? Because that would that would infer like some hormonal other stuff that's response. But, yeah, but for for from a pragmatic perspective, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but also then if you if you're fasting for 16, 20 hours or whatever, like that is you know that's not anabolic, and you don't seem at least from our research, it's not like you get a rebound. Oh, I bought that. that guy's anabolic fasting guy. <laughs> oh God, damn it! Oh, um, I was just gonna open that up this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a funny thing, you know, Gandhi wasn't jacked, you know, <laughs> like, um, but like people say, but well, look shredded. at this, look at this guy. He's, he's big and lean and he does fasting. Well, I'm, I'm not saying you can't build muscle doing intermittent fasting. Right. You certainly can. Right. Uh, is it the best thing you can do for optimizing your muscle mass? No. Probably not. Mm-hmm. But if your goal is not optimizing your muscle mass and strength and your body composition, and it's, you know, are there some help? Or if it helps you, you know, control calories, there is some evidence that some people do better with uh, time restricted eating compared to just counting calories or overall restriction. There's some people who do better. And so that's where I use it. If people say, 
hey, listen, I, I know that this is the downside of this, but I just do better this way. I feel better this way. I work out better this way. Um, it's better for my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Then hell, it, I'm fine, right? We got to keep in mind, like, what's the most important thing? Consistency. Like, just getting sure. somebody to be consistent and make it a lifestyle. So if that's how they're able to make it a lifestyle, who am I to say, no, you have to do it exactly mm-hmm. this way? I Like I said, I try to be pragmatic above all else you you think you you ever consider trying a, a prolonged fast in the, in nah. the future <laughs> no uh listen if i found that i had cancer the first thing i'd do is fast for three days mm-hmm. and go on a ketogenic diet if i if i found out i had cancer that's the first thing i would do um, now why wouldn't you try it other than that right or why well, would you be it, proactive about that if, if you because okay let me put it to you this way why wouldn't you just start taking chemotherapy now well, that's a big. There's a big. Difference. I know, I know, but what I'm my point I'm trying to make is what prevents disease isn't necessarily the same thing as yeah. what's needed to treat disease. Well, forget about preventing. Once you forget once about preventing disease. Hey, let me let me finish. Okay. Sal. <laughs> <laughs> so once you've you know your body is a pretty elegant system. Once you've gotten to the point where you've actually insulted that system so much to where you're really sick, that actually takes a lot because there are a lot of safeguards. Like when you that. take biochemistry, one of the things you come to understand is. It is amazing shit doesn't go wrong more often. Sure. Right? We actually have extremely ele- – we have like very redundant – We're very redundant, resilient. Redundant and re- more redundancy upon the redundancy to make sure that stuff doesn't happen. It's also why there's usually no magic solutions. Like people were like – they found out that uh, folostatin was a myostatin inhibitor. And they're like, oh, man, we finally found it. And they gave it an injection, you know, because it turns out that when you turn myostatin off, other things end up turning sure, on, right? To balance it out, right? Exactly. Myostatin is more regulatory in, in development when your cells are cells are still dividing. Mm. But that's I'm getting off track. Um, so, it, so what I would say, I think that more of what is most important for preventing cancer, and I don't want to, I'm not a cancer expert, so right. I'll qualify that. Definitely not a cancer expert. Is overall healthy lifestyle. Making sure you're exercising, controlling your calorie intake, and having healthy lifestyle habits, right. right? But once you've insulted that system to the point where you have massive dysregulation, now it's going to require a much bigger punch back, so to speak. Sure, right? sure. So you're going to require – you have a massive insult. You're going to require a massive response. Sure, sure. Right? Sure. So um, now there, that, that being said, and I, I don't know a ton about this, there are – you know, the, the thought process behind lowering your glucose availability – and actually, from what I've seen, it seems to be more about raising the ketones than it is about lowering glucose. Is <clears throat> most cancers have some? I don't want to say most. A lot of cancers have um, dysfunctional mitochondria, so they're glucose obligate users. Mm-hmm. They can only lose glucose for fuel. So obviously, by providing another fuel source, you're kind of effectively starving the you're cancer. You're weakening them. What is that right. called? The Warburg effect. I Warburg think? hypothesis. That's yeah. right. That's right. So, so, so there are some though that can that can operate off ketones and may do better off ketones. So it probably depends on the specific type of cancer that you have. Cancer is pretty smart. Cancer. So I I did some uh, an undergraduate. Uh, I mean, you can cut off their blood supply and they'll create their own yeah, yeah, blood so supply. Yeah, it's like a hydra. It's it's like a hydra. You cut off one head and two mm-hmm. more grow back. I had a family member who who uh, had terminal cancer and didn't wasn't able to make it. I know way too much or way more about cancer than I think I should. And the, and it's uh it's it, it, it's very fascinating in the sense that they're very different. What works for one actually feeds another one. Yeah. Um. And they're just like the human body because it is your body. They're pretty fucking smart. So it's, it's yeah. a, But for you know, it's like it has a brain. You know. Yeah. So, without sounding too woo woo, I mean, I would no, say no. I mean, yeah. Like, I don't want to sound too. You guys know me. I'm not a woo guy. But um, yeah. I mean, you know, the way it acts, it's almost like it's you out thinking the doctors. Off. It is. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, people say, oh, looking for a cure for cancer. There isn't going to be a cure for cancer because cancer is like thousands of different diseases. They all have one thing in common: uncontrolled cell growth. But one cancer isn't the same as another one. You know, the treatment, like my mom has multiple myeloma. That's mm-hmm. going to be different than the treatment for somebody who has lung cancer. Right. Absolutely. Know? Yeah, so so now we forget all that, okay? I'm not saying you should fast for for. But what do you think cancer. about fasting? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, what do you, why not try it for some of the... Because here's the deal, okay? And you're a science guy, so... Man, he's, he's working hard. It's just like he was yeah. trying to get hard and he's smoking weed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
That well, almost happened though. Yeah, peer pressure. Did, so did. we had to settle for for cocaine. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the oh, God. Uh, uh, being a science guy, you look at things objectively. You see studies, but there's also um, well, there's also stuff that's happened cross culturally for thousands of years and is present in the major religions of the world. And many that many times those things are there because they've stood the test of time. And one of those things is fasting for the they'll say the spiritual benefit, but I'll say for the emotional, psychological benefit and being someone who's so type A, I have one gear and and that has caused both my success and also probably contributed to a lot of the shit that's happened to me. I think fast, you would benefit so much from fasting from that sense, like fast and meditate. Like, does that scare you? It wouldn't scare me. I think I think <laughs> I think a twenty four hour fast plus I think would would blow blow your mind. Oh I yeah. Think it, I think just because how aware of your body, how you feel, and the science guy that you are, it will it, at the in the very least, it would cause curiosity in someone like you. I feel mm-hmm. enough to where you go like, hmm, that's pretty wild. That's interesting that I feel yeah. this way. Yeah, well, never say never. I right. mean, maybe a, maybe I will one day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like if you fast, you're acquiescing to the, no, like the haters? I don't uh, give a fuck what anybody thinks. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Unless they're yeah. saying you can't do something. Maybe. Sorry, that's not, that's not true. That's not, yeah, they so wanted to, we just they need to be challenge like, you. Lane, you couldn't fast for 24 yeah. hours. Fuck you. I'll show you. Well, that's, right? Exactly. Well, that's what I'm I'll thinking. fast for 48, yeah. motherfucker. That's, that's what I'm thinking. I feel like you can't. Have you noticed? Yeah. You, I know Definitely you, not a 72. No way. I know you've got a ton of, a ton of people that you've, you've dealt with, battled with, and stuff like that. Is there? Do you notice there's certain things that – really bother you that someone says versus other things that people say and you're like oh whatever you know what I'm saying well, I get a well, lot of that when people really speak outside their turn like speak outside their area of expertise authoritatively that really pisses me off mm. you know or they do th- or, or they they why does that they, make you so angry if I had to guess being the psycho guy who likes all that uh-huh. so that I would think I had a mom who was very authoritative with me and that's me rebelling against that as an adult with my adult relationships nah. no nah uh, more so that I know what went into actually like doing an advanced degree and I'm not saying someone has to have an advanced degree to be smart I'm not saying that um, but you know when you're when you're not going to be great at five different things Right, you're great at one thing. Maybe you're really good at a couple things. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, unless you're Leonardo so, da Vinci. Yeah, being, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we're both Italian, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he always wants to throw that in there. There's a lot of common liability. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, somebody is a heart surgeon. They might have had one semester of a light nutrition course. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. They have no bi- no more than I have any business talking about, you know, like when we just talked about cancer, I just qualified that by saying, I'm not an expert. I think I've read some things. I didn't say, do this. This is the way it should yeah. be done. Mm-hmm. The, you know, I think they're qualified to say something. I think they're not. I don't think they're in a position, though, to lean on their education as their well, everybody has a right to an opinion. Yeah. Right, right. You have, well, a, and, and you also have the right to be told that your opinion is full of shit. Of course, very, that's, very that's true. You don't have a right to not have your feelings hurt. I mean, that's, that's, the, a, that's yeah. 100%. I mean, listen, you, you can you can say that you know sugar is toxic. I'm not talking about you, Sal. Sure. Uh, just whoever, Thomas Delau or whatever. It's not whatever, toxic. Whatever, it causes whatever the guy. Whatever the guy. <laughs> 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 so just uh, and I have and I have the, the right to say <laughs> that escalated. That's dude. actually bullshit. Yeah, 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 and yeah, you don't know yeah. what you're talking about. No, no, no. So no. artificial sweeteners do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so and they make you cough it's you know the, the Dunning Kruger effect. Unfortunately, like, you know, when you first start in something, you know that you know nothing. But then when yeah. you learn a little bit, you actually think you know way more than you actually know, right? Then you know yeah. more, and then you and then as you, know you start shit, to know yeah. more and more, yeah. you realize, oh, actually, I don't know very much. And then it starts to come back up right near the end, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like I don't even feel real comfortable. Like if somebody asked me a you know a vitamin K question, mm-hmm. I'd be like, yeah, it's important for blood clotting. <laughs> That's yeah. about it. I don't feel qualified to really talk about much yeah, else, yeah. you know. Well, I've, so al- I've always I've always appreciated which I mean that's ex- that's a how I found you originally way back when was you were the first guy online that I thought was 
calling out all the bullshit that was going on in the bodybuilding world with all the, the bro science. And, I, uh. you know, I was a, a guy that I know for sure I didn't know more than a lot of these scientists, but I knew more than what these bros were talking, sharing yeah, with each other. Yeah. And I was seeking out, okay, there's got to be somebody who knows more than I do in this field. So there wasn't a lot. And you were <laughs> one of the first few. And so I know you made a big name by being that guy who kind of called everybody out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that I could – there were times when – I'll tell you the evolution of that mindset. I actually – I kind of wanted to call people out, but at the same time, I didn't want to be known as the guy who called people out. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't want that to what I'd be known for. And my approach was at first, I'm like, all right, you know, I'm a libertarian. So I'm like, all right, the market will sort this out, mm-hmm. right? If they're full of shit, the market will sort this out. And you figure out that they kind of game the system, you know what I mean? Especially with these coaches who have, like, who are also promoters and embedded with organizations and all this kind of stuff. Like, oh, you ridiculous. realize that there's, there's, it's not going to happen that way unless you say something, right? So that was about 2012, 2013 yeah. when I really started. I, I, I don't think there's very many people I call out by name. You know what I mean? You're just calling like, out the bullshit. I was calling out. I was trying to target the practices rather than the people. Right. You weren't saying this person. You were right. saying. No, listen. If somebody directs me to something and I come up there and I, I see something, I might just say something on their post, you yeah. know? Yeah. But um, I think Charles Poliquin has threatened to beat me up with a baseball bat more than once. Wow. Uh, <laughs> you, dude, I, there's another polarizing Dude, you guy. are, you're, uh, you know, here's the deal. Like, you're you're definitely polarizing. I know mm-hmm. in our forum, so we have a private forum. and Oh, I'm sure that's fun to read. Well, no, I'll oh, tell you. No, I'll tell you what. perfect. There's people that yeah. love you on there. I'm sure. Yeah. And then there's people like, I can't stand there's him. There's arguments I'm amongst them. He's like a crazy, zealot or you know, he's yeah. dogmatic. Yeah. And the other people are like, no, he's great. He's this and that and the other. Yeah. And here's what I always say. I'm passionate. I'm not dogmatic. No, no. I think you guys would agree with that. Well, let me explain. This is... I come to your defense on mm-hmm. people who tend to not like you, and this is what I always say: like whether you agree with the guy or not, because I don't, I definitely don't agree with you on everything, or at least I think when we start talking, we end up finding out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we end up discovering that really, what, what you know, that You're we closer agree, than you are. We agree more than we disagree. But here's the bottom line: like I always appreciate and respect anybody who is going to talk straight, and I yeah. can ask you a question. And you're going to talk straight to me, and we're going to have a conversation. And I fucking appreciate that. And I don't care if we disagree on everything. So yeah. at the end of the day, doesn't matter whether I like you or not. And I will say this off the record. Uh, I could probably hang out with you. I think you're a cool guy. I, I, I don't see any problem with you. But I respect you. And I think that that's more important. And it's because, again... You come on the show. We talk to you. We can ask you questions. You're gonna fucking talk about it. Mm-hmm. You talked. You know. You you went on your own Super social media to talk everything. about your person. Yeah. Like, let me tell you something. You know, uh, you put yourself out there to be ridiculed. Uh, you got to have a big set in order to do that. And I respect that. So that's what I respect most about you. And I appreciate you coming on the show, letting us talk to you, answer, ask these questions. You know, we don't agree on everything, but you still agree to do so. So I appreciate yeah, I, that. I well, th- thank you. I had somebody uh, say something the other day. They're like, man, what did they say? They were like, I just, I had said something like I cursed or something like that in the post. And somebody was like, couldn't you try to be more professional? I said, listen, man, if you want vanilla and politically correct, you came to the wrong spot. Okay. Like, do you want me to be like everybody else who's like, Mm -hmm. you know, who's just like, oh, well, don't want to offend anybody because they might buy something one day. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to tell you how I really feel. Or I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to answer that. Sure. You know, mm-hmm. like that's <clears throat> that's how I'm going to do it. And, you know, I can say there's a, there's a you know, Adam could sit here and psychoanalyze me for another three hours <laughs> and uh, talk about all the stuff that I'm fucked up with. But uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm many things. I have many drawbacks, but there's one thing I'm not, and that's fake. I'm not fake. Mm-hmm. Um, what you see is what you get. And I'll tell you how I really feel. Which is probably why we all connect. I yeah, mean, that's something that we yeah, va- I mean, we, we value integrity. We val we we value that. No way in a million years would we invite you back on the show if we thought you were a a, a, a charlatan or a bullshitter or you no. lacked. You know, thank you. Yeah, that's there's no way in hell. Um, uh, we've there's been guests that we've had on the show. I'm not gonna name names, but they were nice and this and, Come that, on. and they left and we're like, you know what? That was fucking ridiculous. I'm not gonna talk to. I, I, it's very difficult to have a good conversation with fake people. Mm-hmm. I definitely do not think you're fake which I think is part of the reason why you're so polarizing. Mm -hmm. I think the other part of the reason, and maybe you can agree or disagree with me, is because you 
are ready to fight all the time. Like you have your fucking hands up ready to throw Let's down go. Yeah. all yeah. the time. Always up for good mental scrap. Yes, absolutely. And I think uh, maybe you jump the gun sometimes a little bit or Probably. maybe – Maybe you, when, when it's time for you to hit, it's like you don't, they slap you and you reply with a tank. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah you know what I mean? Like, way more than I need to. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm used to getting it a lot. Yeah. You know, and it's always been that way because I think, I think when you're outspoken and you're passionate and you tell people how you really feel, some people aren't going to do well with that. And, um, you know, some people just ain't going to dig you. And, you know, one thing mom told me, and I, I agree with this, she was like, honey, you're never going to make everybody happy. You're like, you, some people are going to hate you just for breathing, just for being who you are. So you might as well just be who you are. And that was some great advice. So, you know, if if there's some people out there who don't like me or whatever, sure, would I like, would I like everybody to like me? Of course. But you know what? Like, there's certain people like, uh, you know, Oh fuck it, we're all we're all being. I'm sure he'll make a video, but whatever. Like vegan gains, mm. th- this guy who's you know, <laughs> like he told Furious Pete he hoped he died from his cancer. You know that guy's a fucking. Mm. And, and again, some people make mistakes, yeah. right? So yeah. I get that, right? Some people say I'm a piece of shit, but when you're repeatedly saying things like this, and you're just repeatedly an asshole, and the only thing you contribute is criticism of other people, so it's it's just like, yeah. Fuck, where was I going with that? Well, I think people, I, think, I think people. Like, <laughs> I totally I got sidetracked. It just popped in my head. I think yeah. people yeah. like him and like Blaha and these people that you've had. I think they are kind of sick. I don't think they really give a shit about what even the things they're saying to. They just know that they've learned that. That's that, gonna bother me. Where yeah. I was coming with that? <laughs> oh, just well, they've learned that that's that's how to to get you riled up. And I I don't think they really care about even making a point. I really think that that's all they're, they're, they're seeking that. They're well, like, they're both, we can get, let's they're see we can get both fucking nuts. Um, of course, but they know but, how to get your attention. But, and yeah, and to be fair, like uh, they probably won in some ways because I responded like, uh-huh. you know, I, I figured that out a little bit too late, you know, but probably the best thing I could have done in, in, in Blah's case was just fucking not respond and realize that guy's an idiot. Hmm. He lives in uh, like a fucking uh, rental shed or something and is miserable with his life. Like, ha, you win. You wake up in the morning and you win. Right. So just like <laughs> chill out with not being like, who gives a shit what that person hmm. says? But again, that's you like, did. That's right. What? That's the problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That, again, lesson learned. Yeah. Right. And that was um, uh, we talked about um, my business stuff earlier and kind of. You know, I could have fought some things out longer, um, but there's something to be said with just moving forward with your life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, 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 there is a time to fight, you know what I mean? But there's also a time to say, how much energy is this draining from you that you could be using to create and do positive shit, you know what I mean? And in that Blaha case, like, you know, I go back and forth on that. You know, it's kind of like, okay, I made a point. You can't just say whatever the hell you want and have no repercussions. But at the same time, it's like, why did I have to let it affect me? Mm -hmm. Right? I could have just fucking gone on with my life, used that time and energy and and done something better with it. But I think finally I learned from it. You know, who gives gives a damn? Um, Who's the last heavy battle that you've been in with somebody virtually right now? Who's the last one that... Was Vegan Gaines the last one, or you had somebody recently? I don't, I don't think I've ever really got it. No, he wants to debate me, but it's kind of like... Oh, really? He's actually ready. He's uh, actually down to do a debate. Yeah, Is that something you're open uh, to? Oh, boy, here we go. Uh, yeah. So, that's kind of like... We've, I have, tried, to, we've I, tried to host these for you. For I know, a, exactly. Yeah, just, yeah, so, we'll put a so ring together, and we'll yeah. do this. Yeah. So, there's, there's two issues. One, you're not... Oftentimes in debate, the person who just yells the loudest is perceived as the winner. Um, and two, do I dignify that with a response? Like, do I even want to acknowledge? Because that's a great point. The second not, one is a good point. Like, definitely. I'm um, people because he like criticized my PhD. Really, bro? It was so easy. Well, I tell you what. I'll tell you what. You go do one. If it if my PhD is a joke and it was that fucking easy. Go get one. I, I I have one. It's great. Mm-hmm. And guess what? I got fucking paid to do mine. So for a genius like you, it should be fucking easy. So go for it. 
You know what I mean? Come talk to me when you got it. So that's, you know, it's kind of like one of those things. But at the end of the day, it's like. It's kind of like one of those things that you're still dealing with because, I mean, it even fires you up when you retell a story. Yeah, I mean. I I can feel the passion in your voice with (laughs) even saying it. I get more more upset at the mindset of people like that than I do at the actual person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but stop right there. and Why? Why do you? Because I'm just like, why why the fuck do you care? Why do you care about somebody else's mindset? He's (laughs) over in some garage fucking living with his mom still, angry at you because he wants your life. And that yet that makes you fucking angry that he's going to try and mentally fuck you. Like, who cares? Uh, More so to the point of I look at that and like. You actually could do something with that. You have a platform. You could actually do something positive. Ah, with fuck that. him. He can't do anything. <laughs> yeah, obviously, he's not going to. All he can do is get your attention. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. So, see? So, maybe I should go into you for therapy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's not even that. So, one of the best things that was ever taught to me was, you know, before I respond to anybody is to think desired outcome. What is my desired outcome by responding to this person? Now, if I'm being completely honest with myself, a lot of the times, it's to feed my own ego. Yeah. You know, was that. somebody, 100% it's that. Fuck yeah, I know it's that. Hey, now, come yeah. on. But it's, that's an existential. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> that's an existential problem, by the way. It's right. not a Lane Norton problem. No, right. no, no, that's, no. And that's, that's what I'm sharing that I'm with. not going to sit here and say I don't have an ego. Yeah. God. No, you have to. Everybody. We all do. Yeah. We all do. And they, and you know what? They can they can be used for good, too. It's not yes. just a bad thing. It's not. I, I don't believe that the ego is bad. All bad. That's what makes us human. But yeah. we we tend to, when we, when we make... When we do things like that, we have decisions like that. It's it is that me trying to feed an ego or an insecurity that I'm trying to overcompensate for. So if I'm being truthful with myself and I learn to unpack that at, before those moments happen, or when they, because in your case it'll probably happen again. Somebody's oh, trying. They know they can fuck with you, and you got to ask yourself like, okay, and I want to respond, and you're like, oh, I want to respond because this guy's got a huge platform and he's giving out terrible advice. Fuck this zealot, and that's what you want to say. But really, it's like what you got to ask yourself is. Why do you even care? That? Well, when, are you really helping more people that so way? So when it's not an attack, when it's actually just bad advice, I'm not doing it for that person's benefit. I'm doing it for the benefit of the people watching who I might change their mind, right? But in the case of like these other two that I've talked about, honestly, probably it's because when I was bullied when I was younger, I was told not to stand up for myself, mm-hmm. you know? And and no, no hate to mom. I understand why she did this, but she was like, you can never get in a fight under any circumstance. You know, my dad would be like, take me over to court. I'm like, listen, you sure. don't start nothing, but you finish it if you have to, you know, right. like that sort of thing. But I felt like, you know, literally I'd be backed into a corner with kids, you know, saying terrible things, doing terrible things. And I felt like I had no power. You know what I mean? Wow. And so it's kind of like, mm-hmm. okay, well, now you push me. I'm not some helpless kid. I'm going to push back. Right. You You're know? still fighting those buildings. But probably the best way to stand up to that is to not address it at all, you know? Mm-hmm. And actually, that's one of the things my therapist said was, you know, I've had times where I'm not going to go into detail, but somebody would be bullying me and she she would say, don't respond. That's standing up for yourself right. is not responding. Because right. if you give them, if you get riled up, then they're showing that they're getting to you. Right. Mm-hmm. You give your power, so, you give your yeah. power away. Yeah. So, yeah. This, so, yeah. so I, I had some similar experiences to that. And this is, this was really groundbreaking for me was the, the, the bullies that you had when you were a kid represented actual people. But now there's, it's this idea. And now you're, okay, I'm still fighting bullies. It's this person online. It's this per- but in reality, who's bullying you now? Right. You are. Yeah. You yeah. are now your biggest bully. Yeah, yeah. You are now tyrannizing yourself in the sense that you are making decisions that you know that, are, oh, fuck, what am I doing? This is going to end up terribly for me. This is stressing me out. This is not worth the time and energy. But then there's a part of you that bullies you that says, no, never again like before. Yeah. Keep doing this. So you're still... Well, what you learn is we're kind of slaves to our childhood a lot of times. Totally. You know what I mean? Totally. I actually, we actually, Holly and I listened to a book called uh, Your Brain on Love. And you, it's by a guy named uh, um, Tetnik, Stan Tetnik. And he's a, um, he studies uh, childhood attachment. So basically how children interact with their parents. And holy shit, like listen to this book, you under, like not only do you understand your partner better, you understand why dumb, some dumb shit triggers you. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you ever get mad at something and go, why the fuck did I get mad oh, at that? You know what I mean? Like, or even like one where you, it was, a, it was like a knee jerk. Like you didn't even think about it. You just immediately triggered you, you know, hashtag triggered. Uh, um, and so like, and he talks about how your parents interacted with you or how your family interacted with you sets you up for a lot of how your relationships, your interpersonal relationships are going to be in the future. And, uh, 
like, um, you know, there's three different basic categories, islands, anchors, waves. And uh, an, uh, an island, for example, is somebody like their, their most horrifying thing in the world they can be is a bur- feel like a burden to somebody else. Mm. So they like their auto regulation or when their stress is they want to be alone. They don't want to talk. And they want to, they you keep want, everything close to the vest. Want to be on an island. It's all by about themselves. it's all about protecting themselves, right? Mm. Uh, an anchor is somebody who could, who usually grew up in a and typically and he he says nobody's 100 percent of one. Everybody's blends, but you know an island typically had one parent that was very aloof, and if ever the child wanted something, the parent would make them feel like they were a burden. Mm. So that set him them up to feel like later in life that feeling like a burden was the worst sure. thing in the world, right? And then there's anchor families. Anchor families were usually like your strong families. They had mostly good interactions. They never felt like they weren't going to be able to get their affection and their love and the things they needed. They felt stable, mm-hmm. right? And they do well with being alone and they do well with being with other people. And then there's waves and waves are kind of the opposite of island. They, they, their auto-regulation is they like being around people. Um, if they, if something happens, they want to talk about it. 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 They'll beat it into the floor, mm-hmm. right? And usually they had uh, one parent that um, would – waves are a little bit more complicated to explain. But essentially, like, their their auto-regulation is, be, like, clingy. Yeah. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And it also talks about how when you're with somebody, who the person you're with can change how you act. Oh, yeah. So, uh, for example, if you're an island but you are with somebody who's, like, the island of islands, you become more like a wave. Mm. Right? Because – it's like people chase what retreats or or that sort of thing, you know. So if 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 you're used to being the one who's has to be like, oh God, stop being so clingy, and then all of a sudden you're not getting that affection that you usually get. Mm. Now now you're the one who starts being more clingy. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was extremely fascinating. fascinating. I would definitely recommend it, you know. But you understand so much more about yourself and how you interact with things. But I I I, I was telling Holly, I'm like, God, isn't it amazing like how. When you're a kid, you don't really even think much about this stuff. It might bother you for a few minutes, but then later in life, it affects every single thing you do. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? That's actually been like an eye-opening experience for me that like, like in terms of parenting, like not to neglect the little stuff. Oh, fuck you yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. Try not to, you know, don't make your kids feel like a burden when they ask you for something, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Because then they're going to they're going to view that in their relationships as they oh, move God, forward. You're, you're shaping them right now, man. Yeah. It's it's why I think it's so scary when you see so many people having kids at such a young age still. Like I have, you don't even know yourself. Right. I have, I have a My little... buddy Paul was like 35. Right. No one should get married till 35. <laughs> He's like, you don't even know what you want. You know, yeah. Well, sometimes it's the learn. It's part of how you know who you are. Is you got to get you get married young and you get divorced later or whatever. And it's like now I know. And not to say that there's people who stay together and have healthy relationships, but a lot of that is a a conscious effort to grow together and be on the same page and have those hard conversations. If you think you're going to marry somebody and in ten years they're going to be the same person you're married, (laughs) you you signed up for the wrong fucking thing. Yeah, Yeah. that's the bottom line. You're not going to be the same, and they're not going to be the same. And those two people either need to grow together or you're not going to be the same people should yeah. not be together mm-hmm. yeah and That's i think that line. that like one of the things i learned is like i think everybody should get counseling as a couple just like as maintenance like you do like changing the oil on your car you're you know the know second I mean? person mm-hmm. that's told us this on this uh on this trip in fact uh, and i agree with that you know and, and address problems when they come up because the worst thing that can happen is like start to get like that resentment you know what i mean oh, that oh. where you don't even address the the problems anymore you're just like just fuck. communicating that's just that. yeah that's mm-hmm. you know yeah that's when you feel like you can't talk to somebody anymore or whatever or you, or you feel like you can only talk about certain things yeah it just like once that starts to fester mm-hmm. it's really hard but you know people people don't know what they don't know mm-hmm. you know but yeah everybody listening like i would definitely check out even if you're single check out that book because it will make you understand like like um we'll put it in the show notes what's it called yeah, again uh your brain on love your brain on love the neurobiology of healthy relationships excellent and it's like, you know, he talks about too, like people say, well, I always pick assholes or I always pick this or I always, well, the reason you're picking is there's something familiar about that person. And usually he said, our pickers after age 25, for the most part, usually aren't broke. It's just that we don't know how to interact with that certain person, right? Like whatever, because, you know, love is also, we have all this information, but you, you, you can have a person that fits every single thing that you say you want and it just doesn't click. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you could have every single check mark and it just doesn't click, right? And then you could have somebody that only like 
there's only one thing you guys really got to come for whatever reason it just fucking clicks you know what i mean and so learning how you interact with that person based on who they are and based on who you are is like a huge thing. I love it when you get esoteric. <laughs> I, know, just gonna, I was going to call it out. You yeah. just, oh, man. You didn't I was even, about to hug you I was right like, there. You didn't even smoke yeah. any weed. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine if you did. You know, balls you sound like more about love. Yeah. Balls deep yeah. on that stuff. Like, well, hey, man. I keep feeling like one of these trips because we, we have these gaps between seeing each other. He's going to come back and he's going to be all hippied out, dude. He's going to be meditating. Yeah. Yeah, just, oh, dude. Let's I, pull up in the van. So yeah. zen. Yeah. Smoke, yeah. Yeah. I'll open the panel van. The smoke will roll Guys, I found the answer. I dropped acid and everything changed. <laughs> change your life, man. Change no, man. Your life. I mean, it's a, listen. It's a. It's always a pleasure to have you on uh, again because your willingness to talk about whatever and your mm-hmm. openness, and uh, we appreciate it. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to do it. I mean, you know, like you know, I'll, I'll make one point because I don't think I talked about it earlier. But some people said, "Why would you put your personal stuff out there like that?" And I get that criticism. The reason I did it was one, she had already put it out mm-hmm. there, so my my kids were going to see it. And I wanted them to be able to, one, I wanted to do it for me, to be honest, because I just would feel better. I felt better doing it. So it was a selfish thing in one hand. Mm-hmm. Also, I wanted the kids to be able to see, okay, dad fucked up, but dad also took responsibility for it. Mm-hmm. Dad said he was wrong. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And also, so people could learn from my mistakes. You know what I mean? Like, that's what I said in the video. I'm like, listen, if you're going to like, take care of this shit now. Yeah. You know, don't make the same mistakes I made. Like, you know, we can either learn from our own mistakes or less painfully, we can learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. So if that helps some people, it was worth it. So that's kind of why I put it out there, you know, because it, I guess it would be easier to play it closer to the vest and just, cause you know, people are so fickle, like mm-hmm. she had come up, people would call me names and then two months later, nobody cares. Did it you know bother I mean? you that people were saying like, you're doing it just right now because to cover your ass because of what's going out? Did, did that bother you at all? Uh, that I actually put it out after all the settlement was final and everything. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't me trying to try, trying to, trying to get a better deal. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Obviously you got to take my word for that, but, um, no, I mean more like everything that you're going through with like just going through with the nutrition business and like oh plus. that I was doing it for attention yeah yeah uh, I can see how they feel that way yeah you know uh, um everybody has, like I said everybody has a right to their opinion right yeah. I think well, you I do- guess what I would say is at the end of the day you never really know what's going on in somebody's life right. I think you know what if you like somebody for the information they give out and you like the way they interact personally then like that but don't don't think that that person's perfect nobody's perfect we've all done bad things that we regret in our lives of course right? do you think yeah. you do you think you attract a lot of uh, a lot of followers that have a similar story as you like we're bullied and you, like are like fuck like they kind of rage the same way too like over. oh probably i mean you you tend to attract what you put out right you know what i mean yeah. uh so yeah i think probably that's you know when you think about that you're probably you probably literally have a split of bullies and people that have been bullied that follow you so you're yeah. dealing with all the fuckers that you're, you're you've been yeah. dealing with your whole entire life. They're falling because they want to they want to try and. Now bully you're encouraging you. them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so as long as they buy the ebook, we're good. <laughs> what? So, but I always say, you know, that's one thing is like people may hate me, but when I put my information out there, they're still going to listen. You know what I mean? You may hate me, but you're still interested in what I have to say. Well, dude, no matter whether you're an asshole or not, you're a smart guy. Oh, hey, yeah. who said I was an asshole? <laughs> yeah. I know how he really feels. Excellent. No, like like I said, I appreciate you letting me come on. And, uh, of course. You know, for those that don't know, none of this is scripted. This is all just completely We organic. never, oh, everybody yeah. knows us. Yeah, yeah. yeah they know yeah, we're going to so fuck around. It's, you know, I had no idea what we're going to talk about today, but yeah. it's, you know, I like I said, I'm. it's cathartic for me to talk about it. For know? sure. Like, yeah. I... I I feel better after I talk about it. Uh, right. Keeping it close is what what poisons me. Oh, I hundred yeah. percent absolutely. It's I th- we talk about that it's all the totally time. Therapy. That our our shows have, have been that way for us. Uh, fuck, you know, when you start putting out seven hundred episodes, you start really analyzing all the things. Not only the things you're saying, but then your own beliefs. Like, wow, mm-hmm. I said that. Do I really believe that? Why do I feel that way? Why was I so passionate about speaking? Like, you start to really analyze all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's got different belief systems. Everybody's all you can do is one, try to do it the best you can based on what is important to you and what you believe, right? Because at the end of the day, you just got to live with yourself. Right. And so, hey, your, your belief system may be different than somebody else's. It doesn't make yours right, doesn't make theirs wrong, doesn't make it vice versa, right? But make, take actions based on what is in line with your beliefs and what's important to you and your integrity, right? And 
do what you love, you know, and, and, and try to try to find a way to be positive. Like that's, that's kind of my, now again, that's my, my value system. I can't, I can't argue with that. You know, definitely can't argue with that. Try to, so, you know, even when I was going through all this shit I went through, there was this voice in the back of my head that kept saying, keep going, keep this flywheel going, keep pushing forward, keep, keep, and you feel like walking with cement blocks on. Mm. You said that, right? So you feel like, yeah. yeah. What, and I just, okay, even if we're just inching along, let's just keep going. Because if you're going through a hard time in your life, eventually it's not going to last forever unless you die, but it's not going to last forever. Eventually you're going to come out of it. But if you let yourself sink into that and you don't keep moving, you don't try to keep that oh, momentum it's, going, it's even, a if dangerous it's, place. even if it's just inching along, then you're going to come out of it, get to a place, and now you're so far behind because you, you let yourself sink. Right? Does that make sense? Well, it does, and and it's a, it's a dangerous place to be in. It's a dangerous place to sit there and just be, you know. I mean, they've done so many studies on this, right? Where where if if people feel a sense of autonomy or at least a sense of, okay, I can do something about this, way better results than when people yeah. feel like they're completely helpless and they have no choice in anything that's going on. And that's that's always bullshit. Yeah. You, you you can't always control what happens to you. In fact, you can't control a lot of shit that happens to you, but you can always control what you do next. That's it. Right. That's it. And so. It doesn't mean you're going to have good options even, but you've always got options. There's always an option. So, and like the way I just kept telling myself, keep forward, forward. And I'm not saying I would never get down and say, well, it was me. I 100% did that, but I wouldn't let it last very long. It was just, okay, what, what can I do right now today? Because there's always something you can do, but the worst thing you can do is nothing. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks again, brother. Beautiful. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thanks guys. again. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.